Ok, ah, che ha fatto avere lei, ok. Credo di sì. Mi può dare il cellulare per piacere? Ma dove sono? Non c'è niente. Ma non c'è nessuno, dobbiamo aspettare che arrivi qualcuno. Eh, lo so, è un bad time. Eh, quindi saremo solo noi. Ok, John, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Ok, so they're just putting up your PowerPoint. Uh, yeah. Can you please tell us when we need to turn to the next slide? Yes, that's fine. That's absolutely okay. fine. Yeah. Ok, thank, thank you. Okay. Joan, can I ask you a question before we get started? Yes. Where are you from? What do you mean? Do you mean where do, where was I born or where I am where am I right now? <laughs> where were you born? I was born in Warrington in uh, in the UK. And Warrington is about halfway between Manchester and Liverpool. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right, okay. Yeah, I got, yeah. So Emilia says that maybe you're too close to the microphone. Um, what if we okay. moved away? Is that any better? Yeah, that's fine. That's perfect. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Are you going to put the uh, presentation onto slideshow? Because people can see all the slides at once at the minute and it kind of spoils a surprise. Yeah, we can actually see the slides right now. No, but can you put it on the slideshow that so the people can only see the first first slide? Lo puoi mettere sullo slideshow così lei lo vede. Yeah, I've just asked that to the technician. <laughs> Is it my voice too loud? Yeah, it's too loud. <laughs> Okay. Is that okay, Joan? Uh, yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Is it better? Okay, cool. Okay, we'll get started. 
Yeah. Okay, so Joe would like you to uh, thank you so much for having you here. It's such an honor for us. And on behalf of Emilia Di Martino, uh, I'd like to thank you again because it's such a pleasure uh, to hear about your research. So we're really happy about that. So uh, John Bill is a Merita Professor of English Language at the University of Sheffield. Her interests are in the history of English since 700 and in dialect and identity. Her publications include English pronunciation in the 18th century, English in modern times, an introduction to regional Englishes, and when, with Carmen Lamas and Burbano Elizondo, urban northeastern Englishes. She's the co-editor of the Rutledge Handbook of Linguistic Prescriptivism and editor of the third volume of the forthcoming New Cambridge History of the English Language and is currently preparing the third edition of the English language, a historical introduction. So she's gonna talk about the enregistrement on Northern English. Uh, thank you, Joan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, I can't actually share my screen with you because uh, for some reason uh, I have problems finding how to share the screen. So I'm going to have to ask uh, the technician to move on to the next slide when uh, when the time comes. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I want to talk about uh, the way that um, Northern English or Northern Englishes, should I say, have been uh, enregistered um, for, oh, throughout the history of English. And what I mean by what I mean by enregistrement will uh, will become obvious as uh, as we go on. Uh, the first slide, which I see we've moved on from now, um, I don't know uh, whether many of you will have recognised it, but it was uh, a painting by L.S. Lowry, who was uh, a famous 20th century artist, uh, kind of naive uh, artistic style. But his work has become iconic as a way of representing the industrial north of England. And I, I chose that um that slide because it's uh, very representative of the image of the north of England uh, in many people's minds. So uh, what I want to uh, bring to you today is, first of all, I'm going to talk about what the north is. And um, you might think that's a simple geographical matter, but we'll see that it's nothing of the sort, that there are many nuances to what people think of when they think about the north of England and what the connotations of that are. Um, secondly, a little um, theoretical um, excursus into uh, what is meant by unregisterment, because uh, I don't know to what extent uh, the people I'm speaking to right now are familiar with the, uh, the framework of indexicality and unregisterment. I'll try to make it as simple as possible for you. And then the major part of the presentation is going to be historical. As you heard from um, the introduction, my, um, my background is very much in, in the history of English. And I'm interested in, in where the history of English and social linguistics meet and how we can know about the enregistrement of um, varieties of English in the past. So can we move to the next slide, please? Next slide. Yeah, just a second. OK, so it takes a couple of seconds. That's all right. Uh, I realize there's always a bit of a delay. So what do we mean by the north? I'm going to take this in in uh, in various ways. Um, first of all, uh, historically, um, the north uh, was the land north of the Humber. There's still a county of, of England called Northumberland. And um, this, is, this is perhaps the far north today. Uh, linguistically, uh, the most salient features of the north of England, which you can probably hear in my own voice if you, uh, if you uh, listen carefully, is that um, these words, which are two of Wells's key words, um, the words like bath and the words like strut, uh, the way I pronounce them, bath rather than bath, and strut rather than strut, uh, is uh, very indicative of the fact that I'm a northerner. And these are extremely salient. They are features that any English person knows about and can identify a speaker as being from the north or from the south, according to where they, how they pronounce those, 
and um, they're very much part of the discourse of being northern or not. Uh, perceptually, and here I'm talking about perceptual dialectology uh, as well as perceptual geography, what do people perceive of the North? Um, they think of it as uh, either north of Watford or north of Watford Gap, and uh, uh, a map will come up soon um, where I'll show you that. But it varies very much according to your perspective, according to where you come from, according to your identity. Uh, Chris Montgomery has done a great deal of work on this. Uh, the perceptual dialectology of northernness. And stereotypically, that's, um, that's what came from my first slide, my introductory slide. Um, there's a saying, it's grim up north, uh, which means that the north is a place that's very industrial, uh, that has a lot of smoke and industrial grime. Uh, this is, of course, a stereotype that, like all stereotypes, has some basis in historical reality, um, but is not the full truth. But it's one that uh, is very important in terms of uh, the perception of the North and what it means to be Northern. So I'm now going to take you through um, a series of slides which will show you some of the boundaries uh, that people have put on where the North is. First of all, we have uh, a map of, of England, just to remind you of, of where's where in England. And um, we talked about Watford Gap uh, before. Watford Gap is in fact a service station on the M1. And um, where on the map it says Northampton is, is more or less where that is. Now, to my mind, that is a long way south, um, but um, particularly people from the south see that as the beginning of the north. And I suppose there is uh, the clue in the name Northampton, but that's um, a very, um, a very cliched idea of where the North begins. So for the next slide, uh, there we have um, the dialectological uh, boundary uh, for the long A in Bath. This is, you can see that it, it kind of goes along the middle of the country. And um, although these things are never exact, south of that line um people uh, will say something like bath in the southwest it's more like bath um, north of that line uh, for the most part they'll say bath um obviously on the boundary things get fuzzy and uh people who have had uh, elocution lessons in the north might say bath but it's highly unlikely um highly educated people uh, like myself, um, from the north, still keep this short A in Bath. Next one. The next slide should be the strut foot boundary. And um, strut foot is meant to be um, a series of, uh, it's meant to be a pair of, uh, a minimal pair to show two different phonemes. Sorry, you've gone too far. Can you go back, please? Uh, these slides, they show one, they sh you need to click once because they show one, uh, they show one thing at a time. And um, yeah. uh, so the strut foot boundary, for me, strut and foot have exactly the same pronunciation. For people south of that line, they have a different pronunciation. And they are very strong and stable linguistic markers of what the North is. As you can see, um, the North, according to these two linguistic markers, um, it's, it's quite a lot. It's, it, it's more than halfway across the country. Okay, now we'll have the next slide. Yeah, I, I was hoping these would come one at a time because uh, I'm having trouble to, um, to get myself... Uh, these are various uh, markers and... Uh, had I been wielding the mouse, you would have seen one at a time. But uh, we'll go through them all at once and we'll probably save some time. Um, the red marker is um, the boundary of the north and south, according to uh, Helen Jewell, who's a historian. Um, the blue marker is uh, a marker of Britannia in the Roman Empire. Um, north of that is what uh, the Romans called uh, Britannia Inferior, and south of that is what the Romans called uh, Britannia Superior. Uh, those words didn't have the meaning they have in English today, but they have been interpreted as such. Um, sorry, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to uh, 
negotiate two things at once here. What I'm going to, I can't see the slide on your, I've got it, it's okay, no problem. Um, okay. The uh, yellow line is the southern limit of the Dane law. Um, the uh, south of north of that line is uh, the area that um, was ruled by the Danes uh, for a short while in the, in the Middle Ages. And this uh, association with the north, uh, with the Danes and Vikings, is something that uh, persists in stereotypes. The light green line is uh, the, the line drawn by Daniel Dawling, who is a human geographer, and he uh, draws this line according to socioeconomic principles. Um, the uh, sort of purple line is one by Ian Jack, um, who was a political journalist. The um, scarlet line is from the Crown and Country Planning Association, which is a government association. The dark green line uh, from a socioeconomic commentator, Smith. The orange line, the Ordnance Survey Map, you'll notice that the Ordnance Survey Map and, uh, and the Town and Country Planning Association are, are very, very uh, straight lines. Then we get on to the um, dialect, map, dialect lines. The black one is Ellis's um, line for the northern area, and you'll see that that's very far north. Um, he really saw uh, he defined the north according to strict dialect, dialectological criteria, and um, the far north is what he sees as the northern area. The magenta line is the Trudhill's um, line for the beginning of the north and the, the boundary between the north and the south based on survey of English dialects data. The um, darker blue line, um, Wells's uh, division, and then we had the, we have those two dotted lines that I talked about before, the strop foot and the uh, the bath bamboo. Um, so you see that this the idea of what is the north um, is extremely varied, and it covers um, a large slice of the of the country, which to some by some criteria is northern, and by which some other criteria is not northern. And um, it just so happens that I come from this part of the country that's kind of um, in, in, in the bottom of what is seen as the north, uh, and yet I consider myself absolutely northern. So that's just to show you the, the complexity of what's uh, considered to be the north from various criteria, some of them geographical, some of them uh, bureaucratic, some of them linguistic, some of them historical. Um, and uh, all of those play a part in the the identity of the north and the and the the way that northern english is enregistered okay now we can go on to the next slide yeah it's the same thing next one uh well i, I think yes that's it. that's the one i wanted yes um, <laughs> So these two uh, photographs that I took um, are representative of the stereotypes that um, persist as to the north and the south. Um, the first one is a t-shirt that you can buy in Sheffield. And um, it's a t-shirt advertising a particular kind of sauce that is only, bought, is only made in Sheffield and that uh, somehow encapsulates the identity of Sheffield. People from Sheffield who are living elsewhere crave this sauce. And it was a very local uh, factory. And uh, it's, they, they got a new um, marketing person who uh, really uh, did a great job of marketing Henderson's Relish and using the identity of the North. And you can see that this T-shirt says Henderson's Strong and Northern. And the idea of Northerners being strong, uh, being vigorous, being hardy, um, is one that is, is it's very persistent. And of course, if you are from the North, uh, you can be very proud of this identity. And if you're not from the North, uh, you can acknowledge that it's something positive, but also make fun of it. 
uh, the flip side of that is on the second one, which isn't that easy to see because it's a picture that I took in Sheffield Station. And uh, it's an advert for a kind of chewing gum that's, uh, that has a, a liquid centre. And uh, it advertises with chewing gum as soft and a shandy drinking southerner. Um, Chewing gum is uh, a drink that is half beer and half lemonade. And uh, southerners, from the northern point of view, are often described as shandy drinkers because northern people can, uh, can drink, can, can hold their drink. Southern people are much too soft and weak to be able to drink properly. Um, I'm not endorsing uh, overconsumption of alcohol here. I'm just uh, saying what the stereotypes are. So this is a joke um, for Northerners against Southerners, that Southerners are soft, Northerners are strong, Southerners are weak. Um, those are very persistent stereotypes that I think uh, go back to, um, go back historically to the association with the Vikings, who of course are strong and drink a lot, um, to the fact that the North is colder than the South, um, I get people in France where I live um, when they see that I'm only wearing a t-shirt and it's very hot outside, asking me why I'm not wearing why I'm not wearing a coat. And I jokingly say in French, "Well, it's because I'm from the north of England and I'm a Viking. Uh, I can I can take the cold." The fact that I'm large and blonde also helps with that uh, with that image. So um, those are the recurrent stereotypes of the north. Now we'll go on to the next slide. And I'll try and see if I've got, yeah. And now we're going to talk about enregistrement. And uh, forgive me if you already know this, but I, I don't know that you know. So I've been talking about mainly things other than accent here. I've been talking about a set of social characteristics that are associated with the North, a set of perceptions that are associated with the North. And in the framework of um, enregistrement and indexicality, this is all important. Um, uh, Asif Fagar, who's one of the main um, expositors of the framework of indexicality and enregistrement, puts it this way. The term accent does not name a sound pattern at all, uh, alone, but a sound pattern linked to a framework of social identities. That framework is what I've been presenting so far. The social identity is recognised indexically as the identity of the speaker who produces the utterance in the instance and described metalinguistically through the use of identifying labels. So when we talk about a northern accent, we're not simply talking about um, the U in strut and the A in bath. We are evoking a sound pattern that's linked to these perceptions of what it means to be northern and that are um, associated with the identity of the speaker and when people discuss um, the northern accent they use metalinguistic labels to talk about this or to write about this and these metalinguistic labels are the clues we have uh, from the history of the language to see how um, a particular variety of English gets enregistered. Okay next slide. Agar talks about the, the process of enregistrement as the identification of a set of linguistic norms as a linguistic repertoire differentiable within a language as a socially re recognized register, which has come to index speaker status linked to a specific scheme of cultural values. So what we call an accent or a dialect is a linguistic repertoire which we can differentiate from others within the language and strictly as linguists, we will define that in strict linguistic terms. But in, in sociolinguistic terms, that repertoire of, of uh, linguistic features talks about or uh, evokes the status of the speaker and the cultural values that go with it, and actually can be used by speakers to, to evoke those. Um, when trying to present a persona. And next slide. And lastly of all, indexicality. Um, indexicality is the association of um, 
well, it doesn't have to be a linguistic feature. It can be a non-linguistic feature, but as linguists, we're talking about linguistic features of the way that the, the process and the, the levels at which these linguistic features are associated with a social feature. Uh, this comes from the work of Michael Silverstein, and he talks about different levels of indexicality. Um, he calls the end level uh, end level a correlation exists between a linguistic feature and some specific social category. Now that may be um, a correlation that um, is not that the speakers themselves are not um, consciously aware of. It may be something that we as linguists notice. We can see that uh, members of this social class use this feature, members of, you know, uh, members of this social network use this feature. Um, it may be something that if you if you told these people about, they, they would be surprised. Um, it hasn't yet come to the level of consciousness where people um, talk about it, uh, use, use a lot of met metalinguistic descriptions about it. At the N plus one level, um, it, it becomes more associated to schemes of social values. Um, and this might actually be quite complex, but um, people become more aware of it. And this can go on and on and on because uh, you can get another level of interpretation, uh, particularly when a new ideology comes in. And we'll, we'll talk about new linguistic ideologies giving new interpretations to Northern English through the history of English. So um, um, it's quite a simple thing to understand. It's simply that association of a linguistic feature with some uh, social category. And, um, it, you know, the levels uh, can be seen as, as being um, a greater consciousness of this. But uh, in Silverstein's view, it could do with a reinterpretation at each level. OK, now we're going to get on to the history of English, I think. Next slide. So uh, I, think in the, I think in the introduction you said that I was, a, I was an expert in the history of English from 700. Um, there's, a, there's a digit missing there. I'm, I'm an expert in the history of English from 1700. Um, so uh, old English is not my forte. So if I say something um, too simple here and there are old English experts out there, forgive me. Um, but what we do know, and what I remember from my undergraduate days, is that dialects of Old English were different from the start. Um, and that might be an obvious thing to say. So as far as we have records of English, there has always been dialectal difference. Um, and I'll, I'll give you that uh, first uh, picture of um, the kingdoms of Old England, old, of, of uh, Anglo-Saxon England to simply show that you have a kingdom called Northumbria, which is north of the Humber and is definitely the north. You have a kingdom called Mercia, which is um, in what we would call the Midlands today. And you have those other kingdoms, Wessex, um, East Anglia, etc., in what we'd call the south. And it's always been the case from the earliest records that Old English in the north differed from Old English in the south. And on the next slide, I've got a couple of examples of that. Okay, so these are two versions of Cadman's hymn, um, the earliest extant poem in English. And the first instance is in um, the translation of Bede, who is the, is the Bede, Bede's ecclesiastical history is where we see this, first written in Latin, of course. But the Northumbrian translation from 1731 is on the left, and the, the West Saxon um, translation from the 9th century is on the right. Now, these are just some examples, and of course, um, sharp eyed linguists will say, uh, could the difference between these two be because the second one is much later than the first one? Well, that, that's so, but these differences persist. So I'm just using these as an example. Um, you can see that uh, the first line, Nu Chulan Herian, uh, in the Northumbrian translation, it has a monothong, H E R, no, uh, H E R G A N, and in the West Saxon, it has H E R E G E A N. So you have a diphthong in the West Saxon and a monothong in the Northumbrian. 
And on the second line, you see that again. You have Ward in the Northumbrian and Wayard in the West Saxon. And that difference between the uh, monothong in the Northumbrian and the diphthong in the West Saxon is, is, is something that's um, you know, a, as clear a category of the difference between Northumbrian and West Saxon um, Old English as the uh, Bath Bath isogloss today. So that's just an example to show that this has always been um, the case that Northern English has been different from Southern English. Next slide, please. Now, that's all we have. We know that they were different. Um, the linguists, we can observe that difference. We can say, here's some Northumbrian English. We know it's Northumbrian. We have uh, external evidence that it's Northumbrian. Here's some West Saxon English. They're different. Um, but we have absolutely no evidence that Anglo-Saxons were aware of this. Um, maybe they were. Uh, but there's no evidence, and the reason there's no evidence is that there is no um, extant metalinguistic comment about this. And that may be because there is so little extant Old English anyway, and it tends to be very restricted in its genre. It may be that um, the, the Anglo-Saxons were aware of the difference between the North and the South, and they were associated with uh, social characteristics but we simply don't know. So as historical linguists, we are giving this N order identicality. It's something that we can observe, but we have no, no um, evidence that it had any uh, connection to social values that people were aware of, which is why I've said it has N order indexicality with hindsight. We can only trace um, the uh, enregisterment of Northern English when we have metalinguistic comments, because that's the source of information about them. So we'll go on to the next slide and we'll see some of the earliest metalinguistic comments. Emilia. Right. Uh, you probably, some of you are probably familiar with this. This is one of the very first metalinguistic comments about the language of the North. Um, it's from um, Provisor in 1380, and I've modernised, the, or rather Katie Wales has modernised the language. All the language of the Northumbrians, and especially at York, is so sharp, slitting and frotting and unshaped that we southern men can barely understand that language. I believe that is because they are near to strange men and aliens that speak strangely. Um, what is what is are saying about the North here? Um, first of all, uh, the North is othered. We Southern men can hardly understand it. So uh, it's, it's noticing the contrast and saying it's different. But it, there is also some evaluative language, some uh, implicitly evaluative language in the descriptions of the sound of it, sharp, slitting, frotting, unshaped. Um, that suggests that the language sounds very harsh to him. And um, it's intriguing that he talks about this being especially at York, because York is the Viking capital of um, Northumbria. Um, is there a hint of Vikingness about that? I may be overinterpreting there, but this idea of the Northerners having a language that is harsh that is hard for Southerners to understand. And lastly, I believe it's because they're near to strange men and aliens. Um, I've suggested that aliens mean Scots because uh, they're near the border. Um, it could also be a, a sort of Dane law thing, but um, it's suggesting that the Northerners are others. Are other. They're not like us. There's something not English about them uh, from Treviser's point of view. That's suggesting there's N plus one indexicality here. Um, the visor has noticed what Northerners sound like. Uh, he has views on it and he associates it with a scheme of values that is otherness, harshness, and so on. Okay, next slide. If we move on to the 16th century, um, in a way not much has changed. We have uh, a very similar uh, kind of indexicality of the North. This is one of the most quoted uh, passages in, in the history of English. 
um, putting them in the art of English poesy, um, suggesting uh, what kind of English a poet should use. Neither shall he take the terms of northern men, such as the northern daily talk, whether they be noblemen or gentlemen or of their best clerks, it doesn't matter, nor in effect any speech used beyond the river of Trent, for no man can deny but the verbs is the pure English Saxon at this day, yet it is not so courtly nor so current as our southern English. Now, I think we might have a, a sort of N plus one plus one index of quality here, because although he is... Um, He's using that same discourse of the North being other. Um, he's, he's bringing in something that is a bit more positive. He's suggesting that theirs is the purer English Saxon at this day. Um, and this idea that the Northern English is purer, that it's closer to the Anglo-Saxon, is um, it's another indexicality. It's another interpretation of uh, what northernness means and it's something that was um was current in the 16th century in the idea that uh, uh Spencer, for instance used northern words to evoke uh, authenticity and rusticity um uh, pastorality uh, and uh, it's still a sort of um myth about northern english that it's closer to the anglo-saxon to this day so here we're getting um I'll mention this later, but uh, Penelope Eckert talks about the indexical field where um, a feature or a variety might have a lot of different meanings, some of them actually clashing with each other. And um, people can draw upon this mean these meanings to present different personae. So some poets would have been using Northern English to present something pastoral, uh, authentic. But what uh, Putnam's suggesting is that a poet should be using a kind of English that is courtly, in other words, um, suitable for use at the royal court, and current, in other words, up to date. So he's acknowledging that Northern English is authentic, it's more like the Saxon, but he's putting more value on a kind of English that's up to date, and that kind of English is Southern English. So you're getting a new interpretation of what the um, lexicon of Northern English is. Okay, next slide. Um, this is another 16th century passage. And um, I think uh, going more on the side of uh, Northern English not being courtly or current, um, Wilson is saying that um, the nature of a person is determined by where, by where he comes from. Um, a bit like in, in France, they, they suggest that according to terroir, the, uh, the nature of the wine is, is determined by the soil it's grown on. Um, the realm declares the nature of the people, so that some country bringeth more honour with it than another doth. Shire or town helpeth somewhat towards the increase of honour, as it is much better to be born in Paris than in Piccadilly, in London than in Lincoln, for that both the air is better, the people more civil, and the wealth much greater, and the men for the more, most part more wise. He's saying nothing about language there, but he's giving you a whole package of values about the North and the South, um, choosing Paris and Picardy and London and Lincoln because they alliterate as well as because uh, one's in the, well, Paris isn't in the South, but it's the capital. Um, but uh, these, uh, these great cities, um, you know, people who come from them are bound to be better. Um, which was kind of crazy, but that's what he believed. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so we might see this as an N plus one plus one order. Um, the comments become more specific. And as we get to the 16th and the 17th century, as well as saying what they think Northern English is like, um, they, they start to mention specific features and uh, you know, in, in, in dialect glossaries, uh, some of them mention particular features. And those features are associated with those northern stereotypes of, of on, the one si on the one side, harshness, um, uh, lack, of, lack of civility, and on the other side, authenticity. And you get a few specific comments about these northern features. So we're beginning to see um, the idea of uh, what Northern English is, you begin to get dialect literature in Northern English in this period as well. And so you get a repertoire of features used in those texts. Next slide, please. 
Okay, in the 18th century, we have what I think is very much uh, Silverstein's idea of um, uh, a re-evaluation, a, a change in the way that, um, a change in the ideology of language. We, we have prescriptivism uh, coming in, in a big way in the 18th century. So although there's no change in the, in the attitudes towards Northern English, um, what happens in the 18th century is that these features become re-evaluated in terms of right and wrong, um, in terms of uh, Northern English simply being wrong, not just it sounds harsh, not, not just it's not courtly, um, not just it's not up to date, but it's just plain wrong because you get the authors of pronouncing dictionaries like John Walker um, prescribing exactly how English should be or should be uh, pronounced. And here we have our, our strut foot um, boundary again, um, acknowledging this specific feature of Northern English, which wasn't acknowledged before because it's actually quite a recent feature from the 18th century point of view. Um, the, um, the split between uh, strut and foot, or it's strut and foot in the south of England is something that really only comes in in the 17th century. So it's an innovation and people become aware of this um, in the 18th century and become aware of the lack of the foot strut split, typically northern feature. So Walker says is the sh short sound of the letter U in trunk some letter differ from the sound of that letter in the northern parts of English England, where they sounded like the U in bull, and then nearly as if the words were written T R W O N K, etc. It necessarily follows that every word where that letter occurs must by these provincials be mispronounced. And you've just heard a provincial mispronouncing those, letters, those words because I'm from the north. The other interesting thing here is um, Walker spells these, um, these words with a double O. And to a northerner, this doesn't make sense at all because double O stands for the. Um, sound ooh, not the sound oh. But um, it has become a very stereotypical way of representing Northern English, so that the term up north is often spelt double O-P north. Um, we can't swear that Walker was the first person to use this spelling as a representation of the Northern U, but it certainly stuck. Um, it's certainly a way of representing the Northern U without using the, uh, the international phonetic alphabet. Okay, on to the next slide, please. Um, that was Walker, uh, to, you know, writing as a prescriptive um, author of a pronouncing dictionary, but travellers noticed Northern English as well. This is Daniel Defoe. Um, now, the jury's out as to whether Daniel Defoe actually made these journeys he writes about, but from the point of view of enregisterment and um, indexicality, it doesn't matter, because what he's doing is he's making metalinguistic comments about a variety of English and those metalinguistic comments must have come from somewhere. So whether Defoe actually went to Northumberland and heard people talking like this or whether he heard stories about it, he's still transmitting the idea about what Northumbrian English sounds like. And here he's talking about a feature which we call the Northumbrian burr, which is a uvular pronunciation of R, like R. Um, which is recessive in Northumberland today, but, but um, you know, it, it's only in very rural places and older speakers. But it was obviously alive and picking in the 18th century. I must not quit Northumberland without taking notice that the natives of this country, of the ancient original race or families, are distinguished by a shibboleth upon their tongues in pronouncing the letter R, which they cannot utter without a hollow jarring in the throat by which they are plainly known as a foreigner is in pronouncing the th. This they call the Northumbrian R or Hwao, and the natives value themselves upon this imperfection because forsooth it shows the antiquity of their blood. A nice bit of uh, um, metalinguistic comment here. From Defoe's point of view, it's a shibboleth. It's something that gives them away as Northumbrian. And he suggests that they can't pronounce the R's properly. Uh, Thomas Sheridan, another author of a pronouncing dictionary and an allocutionist, suggested that it was a speech defect. And in fact, um, it's very possible that it is starting as a speech defect. 
Um, but notice that he also says the natives are proud of it. So again, that indexical field, that different way of interpreting it. In fact, there's a there's a myth about the Northumbrian R that um, Hotspur, uh, the the uh, the son of the Duke of Northumberland, who appears in Shakespeare's Henry the Fourth Part One, um, had this as a speech defect, and the Northumbrians all venerated him so much that they copied it. Uh, there's a similar uh, myth about the uvula in French that it was Louis the Fourteenth who started it. So we know it's a myth, but the fact that there's comments about it and that the the, the Northumbrians are proud about of it is is a, a clue to its index quality. Okay, next next slide, please. So why why is this happening by the 19th century? Well, the mobility of the population um, increasingly has led to language contact. Which is why I suspect that when we go back to that Old English um, contrast, you wouldn't have got metalinguistic comment because there wasn't as much mobility. Um, you get this metalinguistic when people meet people who speak differently and they notice. It's a prerequisite for enrichment. In the 18th century, the codification of English, including the uh, codification of pronunciation, led to the stigmatization of non-standard variants. And you get a lot of metalinguistic comments about this in pronouncing dictionaries, grammars, etc. And Northern English speakers explicitly commented on as wrong, as indeed are Fox English, Irish English, Welsh English, etc. Anything that isn't London English is seen as just plain wrong in the 18th century. Okay, next slide, please. Um, however, and here's where we come to the indexical field and that idea of the Northumbrians being proud of their dialect. The other thing that happens in the late 18th century is that you get more dialect literature and um, you get uh, literature written in dialect and literature that associates with dialect with positive characteristics. Um, including um, immensely in the 19th century. And this brings up what Eckert talks about as the indexical field, that it doesn't have to be one or the other, that a feature uh, doesn't have to um, index just one social characteristic. It can index a number of social characteristics, and these can be drawn upon at different times. Um, Eckert uh, wrote a lot about um, what happens in social interaction when people draw upon these indexical features to present a persona, which is kind of what I'm doing today, presenting myself as a northerner. Okay, next one, please. Next slide. Um, and, uh, you can see this in the, um, in the 19th century dialect literature. These are quotes from uh, Patrick Joyce, um, writing well before the ideas about uh, indexicality and, and enregisterment were current. And he's not a linguist, so he wouldn't have known about them anyway. But he talks about dialects speaking to working folk of all occupations and geographical locations, conferring on them citizenship in the nationalities of Lanky, that's someone from Lancashire, like me, Yorkshire Tyke, or North East Geordie. And he talks about dialect literature creating its own symbolic working heroes with the characters of the weaver in Lancashire and Yorkshire, the pitman, the miner, and keelman in the northeast embodying the symbolic virtues of the gradely or the canny lad. Now, this is interesting because um, Asifa Gar talked about um, characterological figures in enregisterment. Um, the idea that um, in enregisterment, you, you have a sort of symbolic, iconic figure who embodies the values of that particular um, persona. Um, here I'm thinking about Amelia's work um, with uh, with Cheryl, uh, who is a wonderful characterological figure of um, the Geordie lass, um, and uh, and uh, Amelia's work talks about how she she presents that persona, although it is genuinely her as well. Uh, so so Joyce is working in a completely different discipline, but he's actually using the same ideas of, as our guard that, that dialect literature creates these symbolic heroes, and the dialect is part of it and the dialect evokes this characterological figure of what the weaver or the miner is like. Now, I realize I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go very quickly through the next two slides. Um, next slide, please. Um, um, 
um, uh, who's a former PhD student of mine, um, looked at Yorkshire dialect literature in the 19th century to see what the um, repertoire of enregistered Yorkshire features were, was. And um, he came up with a, a very clear set of features that is this repertoire, as Agar would say, that is associated with the persona of um, the Yorkshire person, um, the gravely lad. Uh, gravely just means very nice. It's the same as Connie and, and Geordie. Definite article reduction, the use of... Um, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, the reduction of the definite, definite article. So you don't say, um, I'm, in, I'm in the kitchen. You say, I'm in kitchen. Um, different good thongs, uh, coit and weir for coat and wear. Um, different vowels, um, sitch for such. Uh, L vocalization, so you've got out for old. And certain lexical items like out, now, summit, uh, shoe for she, ben for child, gan for go. Um, and what he found was that these um, occurred very frequently in uh, Yorkshire dialect literature and also that there were metalinguistic comments about them. So what you see there is a repertoire, not of Northern English, but of a Northern English. And we'll have the next slide, but I'm not going to spend any time on it because we're running out of time and we want some time for discussion. So the next slide very quickly. Um, next slide. <laughs> Just to show that I found a similar um, repertoire for 19th century Georgia dialect literature, and I'm not going to go into that now because we really don't have time. And I think the point I'm trying to make here is that from going from in the 16th century, a general idea of what Northern English was like, by the time we get to the 19th century, we have repertoires of different Northern Englishes um, of the Geordie, which is the uh, the, uh, the Northern English of Newcastle, the very far north, and of Yorkshire, which is um, the, the dialect of um, the largest county in England, the, the further south, but still very much in the north. And I'm going to finish with this last slide. When, um, when a new instrument uh, is, uh, is, is very much um, out there and people are very much aware of the social meanings of linguistic features, we get commodification. And um, commodification is something that has proliferated in the 21st century for material reasons as well as social reasons, because um, you have the internet, you have uh, the ease of buying things quickly. Um, and, uh, you can only get commodification when uh, something is very clearly unregistered, when people are aware of the social meaning of uh, that linguistic repertoire. This is just one example. Um, it's a t-shirt you can buy, which I would certainly not buy because I'm from Lancashire. And it says, what you always tell a Yorkshire lass. Um, so if you're, a, if you're a woman from Yorkshire, you will wear that t-shirt with pride telling people that um, you are a Yorkshire lass, you're, you're a, a woman from Yorkshire, and that can always tell that the, the, um, the, the, the old um, T form of the, uh, of the second person pronoun, which is still used in Yorkshire, but very much a stereotypical thing, always for always, um, stereotypical Yorkshire features on a T-shirt, which you wear to say, I'm from Yorkshire and I'm proud of it. And enregistrement is a sort of cyclic thing. Those commodities further enregister the, um, the features of the variety and they fix them in our consciousness and associate, them, associate those features, not only with a specific place, which is Yorkshire, but with that whole scheme of social values. So there I will end and hope we have still some time for this discussion. Thank you so much, John, for your very interesting talk. I think we've got a couple of minutes for uh, questions or comments. Is there any question or comment that you would like to ask, John? Okay, I'll start then. Um, so uh, this was really interesting, and um, I saw that you were talking about indexicality. Yeah. So. Um, 
the table you showed us with all the typical features of northern um, England, yeah. do you think is it still possible to uh, you know analyze them according to uh, Guy's coherence model? Or maybe Eckert's uh, bricolage one is the best one to maybe uh, investigate them. Uh, I think. I think. I mean, I'm working in Eckert's framework, so so I mean, that, that's that's what I what I think is the best way to look at them. Do you want to have the slide of the northern features up so we can talk about them? Because I didn't have time to talk about them. Uh, um, can you go back to the slide? Yeah. Matilda's slide. Yeah, I think um I think what what's um what's attractive about the framework of indexicality and unregisterment. Um and I came to this uh quite I mean relatively late, really. I I think it was kind of a light bulb moment for me because um when I was working in sociolinguistics, let's say up until about the 1990s, um, I, uh, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't reconcile um, the Bob's idea of um, indicators, markers and stereotypes with what I was, what I was um, experiencing because um, Lebov talks about these indic indicators, um, markers, and stereotypes as representing different levels of, of consciousness, of self-consciousness, on the part of the speaker as to um, as to the the sociolinguistic variables uh, concerned. And he talks about a stereotype as something that's become um, so um, overtly people are so overtly conscious of it that it's bound to disappear. Um, and I, I, I kind of reacted against that because I felt that it was saying that um, when people become aware of um, particularly a, you know, a, a vernacular uh, linguistic feature, um, they're bound to be ashamed of it. It's bound to be negatively um, stereotyped. And what I was experiencing around me, um, particularly with the, the, the growth of, of the internet and, and, and groups that celebrated their regionality on the internet and these commodities, because I was, I was in Newcastle at the time, which is a place that, uh, where there is great, great local pride, uh, was that these things were being positively evaluated and they were persisting. Um, and although there was definitely dialect levelling going on, um, on the other hand, certain features were persisting, albeit in performative situations. So um, a stereotype um, a stereotype doesn't necessarily die out because uh, people are very aware of its associated association with certain social features. It may persist because it's drawn upon to present a certain persona. Um, and that's why I, I, I like... Uh, I like Eckert's ideas because she talks about the the idea of, of variation as, as not being something that you are bound to inherit because you were born in the Lower East Side of New York or something, but something that you are able to, uh, to manipulate and to draw upon in social interaction. And um, I think as a sociolinguistic, a sociolinguist that, that kind of makes, as a historical sociolinguist, that makes more sense to me. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Is there any other question? We have one more minute or comment. No. Okay. Then thank you very much, Joan. Thanks again. Okay, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Emilia, for inviting me to such an inspiring seminar and with friends and colleagues I've known for years. So thank you, really. So let's start uh, introducing Mirko, Mirko Casagranda. 
uh, who is Associate Professor of English Linguistics and Translation Studies at the University of Calabria, Italy. Uh, his areas of interest include onomastics, critical discourse analysis, gender and translation studies. His publications include articles on toponyms and trade names, gender and translation, and eco-critical discourse analysis. He has authored the books Traduzione e Code Switching, Come Strategia Discorsiva del Plurilinguismo Catanadese, and uh, Procedure di Naming nel Paesaggio Linguistico Canadese, and edited the volume Names and Naming in Postcolonial English Speaking Work. So the floor is yours, Mirko. Thank you. Uh, is this working? Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for your introduction. Thank you, Emilia, for having me here. Thank you uh, for this wonderful organization. And uh, thank you all for, for being here today. Uh, so my talk originally was Froda. In Italiano, diciamo, gli occhi più grandi della pancia. That's very me. So uh, because of time constraint and uh, because I wanted to focus on a case study only, uh, only on one case study, actually here is the, the updated version. So social linguistic variation and uh, um, queer identities in the British TV series Heartstopper. So I decided to focus on um, that uh, TV series only. And uh, uh, the theoretical starting point is within, you know, uh, the uh, debate um, in identity and language and sexuality research, in particular the interplay between language and sexuality, so how sexuality is discursively constructed and represented also in the media, so in uh, TV series in, 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 uh, for me today. And uh, when it comes to um, LGBTQ plus identities, uh, we have, uh, since the 90s, I'd say, uh, scholars uh, um, investigating, focusing on what has been termed, labeled as LGBT linguistics. Of course, that has to be uh, updated, um, including, you know, uh, Q, A, and so on and so forth. Uh, studies in uh, gay speak, camp talk, Polari, and what is also been uh, termed uh, lavender linguistics, in particular by uh, Leap uh, in the uh, 1990s. There are annual, uh, there are uh, conferences in lavender linguistics, uh, even now today. Um, so um, there is a broader term, I'd say, that is queer linguistics. Um, and, uh, uh, what is queer linguistics about? So queer linguistics uh, presents, a, and, I'm, and I'm quoting uh, David Simon and Rocklow, uh, queer linguistics presents a fundamental challenge to the assumption that binary systems for categorizing gender and sexuality are natural, universal, and indisputable. So the problem also with um, LGBT linguistics, lavender linguistics, and so, or some scholars, uh, which is not really a problem, but it's more a matter of positioning. It's like a way to reinforce the binary system. So you accept the uh, uh, homosexual, heterosexual identity, masculinity and femininity, and so on. Queer linguistics actually um, seeks to uh, dismantle that binary of those binaries. And uh, uh, other key concepts in queer linguistics are intersectionality and performativity in gender identity and gender identity construction and representation. Um, because of course, gender identity is not a set of pre-existing static truths, but is rather an emergent, contextual, and intersubjective phenomenon that is constantly open to renegotiation and relies on a system of interconnected citations of gender norms. So uh, constantly co-constructing uh, gender identity, sexual identity as well, in interactions as well. So it is not a pre-existing social fact, but, is, but it is a an ongoing process um, and, uh, and co-construction based on uh, uh, social interactions as well, which has much to do also about, you know, uh, communities, also communities of speech and the way you uh, belong or relate to, to, to them. 
So uh, thinking about uh, queer identities, queer characters in Britain, uh, the first uh, uh, three series that came to my mind, and that's what I actually wanted to work on, are Queer as Folk, Sex Education, and Heartstopper. Uh, Queer as Folk, of course, dates back to the 90s, end of the 90s. Sex Education, now we, uh, the, the fourth season has just been released. That's the, the final season. And Heartstopper is still in production. The second season was uh, released a few months ago. Uh, but, as I said, for uh, time reasons, I decided to focus on Heartstopper only, which is based on uh, uh, Alice Oseman's graphic novels. Actually, the TV series is written by Alice Oseman uh, themselves. And uh, as I was saying before, it is still in production. The first season was aired, was released on Netflix. It's a Netflix uh, product. Uh, last year and the second season was uh, released uh, a few months ago. Um, the two main characters are Nick Nelson and Charlie Spring, two teenage boys who actually fall in love with each other. That's very simple, maybe banal. Uh, one, Ch uh, Charlie Spring, um, the actor is Joe Locke, is already out because he was outed the previous year, whereas the other one, Nick, Nick Nelson, is the... Um, well, we'll talk about this later, but anyway, he has to... Uh, discover who he is and how to define himself and his identity, his sexuality. Um, the TV series is known for being a prism of uh, identities, uh, so of queer identities. We have Charlie, uh, and these are just the main characters. We have Charlie who identifies as gay, as a gay young man. Nick who uh, identifies as bisexual. Elle identifies as transgender. We don't know much about uh, Elle. We know that uh, she um, moved. She went to another school in order because um, um, she was in a uh, male-only school, so uh, she decided to, of course, uh, um, move to a girls-only uh, school. Um, then we have Tara and Darcy, who identify as lesbians, and Isaac, who identifies as asexual. So there are several identities uh, in, uh, in this uh, TV series. Um, I had to uh, sort of find a focus uh, for the analysis, and I decided to focus on social labeling, uh, gender practices, and queer identity. So social labeling as part of a broader discourse on queer identities and their linguistic performances. Um, social labeling is a social linguistic practice to identify name individuals. Actually, it could be extended also to oneself uh, in, in, in a sort of way. Um, by means of uh, terms of address or references. So it's how you address someone, you identify someone by addressing that someone or how you refer to that person. And here I have a quote uh, from McConnell Ginet who uh, extensively uh, worked on social labeling as a gender practice. And uh, labels often identify social, political, and attitudinal groupings into which people quite self-consciously do or do not enter. So uh, what I uh, wanted to do is to look for these labels that are actually also the terms that we need to define ourselves, our sexuality. For example, lesbian, gay, queer, and so on and so forth. So, of course, if I use them as a way to identify myself, those are, so to speak, neutral terms, whereas they could be used also in a derogatory way when they are used to address or refer to someone. So there is an ambiguity in the, in the way, not in the term uh, itself, but in the way it is used by a speaker or a character in this, in this case. So, uh, yeah, the focus is on uh, um, an, an analysis of social labels in a heart stopper as markers of variation, identity, and, of course, also characterization. We need those uh, terms also to create, to represent the characters. And labels were searched in the transcripts of the spoken dialogues provided by 8flix.com, which is a um, website where you can find transcripts from uh, uh, several series. It's very useful. Um, and of course, I, I double-checked them also in the, in the actual uh, audiovisual uh, material. Um, here are, uh, I, I, I know that I don't have much time, so I, I think I'm going 
through the examples very quickly. These are some examples taken from the transcripts uh, where you have actually uh, words, terms that, are, that can be used also as labels to uh, identify sexuality. Um, this is from episode two uh, where Charlie actually falls in love with, with Nick, but uh, at first, everybody thinks that uh, Nick is straight, uh, heterosexual, ginormous heterosexual. So there is no way of uh, Nick being being interested, uh, romantically involved in 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 uh, um, in Charlie, and uh, because it, it works also on the stereotypes. So uh, stereotypes are also linguistically constructed and dismantled. Dismantled. For example, here you have masculine guys can be gay, it's not just a matter of, you know, again, the, the binary uh, femininity and masculinity, uh, and the uh, fact that uh, bisexual people exist as well. Mm -hmm. um, so other examples here, you have uh, the use of gay as a derogatory term. Um, this is one of the, uh, one of Nick's friends, uh, rugby uh, team player, uh, who's actually questioning, asking question about uh, Nick being friends with, uh, with, uh, with Charlie. So is it because, you, do you feel sorry for him because he is gay, uh, as if, of course, gay uh, was uh, um, a, a used uh, from a, a derogatory perspective. Um, and that's considered uh, homophobic. So the use transphobic, homophobic is used quite often in the series to mark a um, linguistic behavior that actually stigmatizes queer identities. And uh, um, there is a scene where the use of neutral they is used. Here is when uh, Charlie and, and Nick are actually, when, when Nick would like to uh, tell Charlie that he is trying to, to feeling, you know, romantically involved with him. And uh, um, so Charlie's asking Nick if he has a crush on anyone at the moment. Uh, and because Charlie assumes, right, that uh, Nick uh, is heterosexual, even though he wishes that he is not, uh, he's asking what she like then. And uh, uh, here you have uh, the, the, the part in bold. You're just going to assume they're a she. So are they not a girl? And so on and so forth. Um, uh, here you have uh, a reference to the term uh, lesbian. And uh, uh, I'm looking for, OK, here, this is also an interesting example, I think, because first Tara and Darcy come out uh, to the, you know, to the schoolmates, and they are proud of that. So they feel like uh, uh, absolute lesbians. So uh, um, sort of revendication of, uh, of 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 that identity. But at the very same time, some schoolmates uh, make fun of them and consider them gross and disgusting. So you have the coexistence of the appropriated term, so to speak, to identify oneself, and the derogatory term. Um, uh, okay, I have to go uh, quickly towards my, my uh, uh, conclusions here. So, uh, as I was saying before, uh, these terms can be used in a derogatory way. Uh, here you have another example uh, from a fight between Nick and Harry. Harry is the uh, homophobe in, 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 in the classroom. And uh, you see, you can't just bring some gay boy into our group that is the rugby team and expect us to immediately love him. So this is a problem with him being gay. And again, uh, it is recognized as a homophobic stance. Um, and uh, uh, that's uh, Harry's reaction. You can't help wanting to protect him, can you? Because he's a pathetic little fag. So some uh, actually uh, real derogatory terms are used also in, in the series. Not so many, just a couple of them. Uh, because it tries to be as politically correct as possible. That, that's one of the characteristics of this uh, TV series. And uh, um, season two is about Nick's exploration of his own uh, identity and uh, the discourse shifts towards bisexuality. So I'm bisexual actually. Uh, and uh, um, here you have a 
quarrel between Nick and his uh, elder brother, David. Uh, so you see again how uh, the term gay is used in a uh, derogatory uh, way, in a uh, derogatory uh, phrasing. So I just wanted to meet the guy that, you know, turned my little brother gay. Uh, so again, the idea of turning out to be gay. And when Nick says that he is not gay, but he is bisexual, um, his brother actually um, goes, if you're going to be gay, at least admit you're gay. So don't hide behind uh, this uh, blurred identity that is actually um, also questioning you. So the, 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 you know, the, the binary again, being gay or straight. Um, and there is also a scene towards the end of season two where Isaac uh, finally uh, discovers that being aromantic and being asexual is the label, the definition for, for him. So um, there is only one occurrence of the term queer. This is interesting, I think. And uh, it's actually outside the school the boys and girls, the, the, the main characters attend. It's where Elle would like to, to go uh, after graduating is Lambert School, a uh, school of art, where actually queer and trans artists and creativity can, can flourish. So it seems to um, imply that, yeah, I'm going to conclude. Um, you can truly be queer and uh, uh, outside the binary system provided by British uh, high schools. So um, other labels, mate, used by heterosexual males to create a sort of uh, in-group sense of belonging, community, and uh, terms of endearment, like my darling, my love, that is used by moms only. Uh, so I think that's also a way to uh, portray them. So it's, a, it's another characterization device. Conclusion, uh, very quickly, sorry, I think I'm late. Uh, so the series is about discovering, defining, and redefining one's identity, which is always an ongoing process throughout the two seasons, and I, I expect that to be also on the third one. Some characters, moreover, resist defining themselves one and for all. Uh, both as characterization elements, because the character has to evolve, and also as a form of narrativization of the constant negotiation of gender norms and sexuality. So the, the, the show is about that as well. And uh, uh, as I was saying before, terms and labels are ambiguous depending on user and addressee. So gay could be ambiguously uh, used in the, in the series or lesbian or the other terms that we have seen. So um, queer characters tend to use queer terminology to describe, identify themselves, while the other characters need further terms to strengthen their sense of belonging in a specific group. So the, the case of mate, uh, for example. So only, let's say, straight character use those uh, extra words. Um, okay, we have already talked about this. And uh, um, last point, gender and gender subjectivity. And we go back to one of those theoretical elements uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. So gender and gender sub subjectivity are co-constructed in interactions. Uh, and I think that Nick is a good example of that uh, because the character is constantly evolving also by the way he interacts with the other characters, especially Charlie. So it's not a pre-existing identity that is immediately uh, used to characterize Nick as a character. And uh, um, last question, are binary systems challenging the linguistic choices of these characters and the way they are represented? Actually, some of them follow the homosexual, heterosexual divide of man and woman. Uh, but other explore a more fluid and queer identity. Also in terms of intersectionality, think about Elle, who is also a black trans uh, woman, young woman, and performativity, so the way uh, gender and sexual identity is performed. Second season goes definitely in that direction. I think that the third one will further develop that. Also because it's, yeah, as I was saying before, uh, they're leaving high school. Okay. Sorry, further research, but maybe I'm not going to talk about that. So thank you very much. Okay. So thank you, Mirko. This was interesting indeed. Uh, however, I'm told that we have no time. I know. Sorry, for sorry, sorry. Question now. In my mind, and, I wanted to talk only about. We'll have time minutes. to ask you 
something maybe later, personally. Yeah, sorry about this. So, our next speaker. Thank you. Is Alessia Battista, uh, a second year doctoral student in uh, Euro languages and specialized. Uh, terminologies uh, at Partenope University of Naples. She earned an MA summa cum laude and final dissertation worthy of publication in languages for international communication and cooperation at Universita Sor Ursula Benincasa and a BA summa cum laude and highest honors in modern languages and cultures from the same university. So you are here in, you're at home. Uh, her research interests focus on uh, English social linguistics, media analysis, terminology, corpus linguistics, and critical discourse analysis. So, thank you. Thank you, Luisa, for this introduction, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Yeah, as a former student of this university, not only is this event great, but also for me, you know, holds a special place Again, in my heart. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, today I will be presenting to you a Part of a wider project, again, because of time reasons, mostly, which is about the representation of non-binary people in the British press. Um, so why newspapers? I think we can all agree on the fact that they hold a, an important decisional power because they get to decide what to talk about and how to do that, which may also have an impact on our own language because we are exposed or we are not exposed to certain language. And all taken together, this may lead to some potential sociocultural and political changes. Um, I've decided for this analysis to look at how non-binary people are represented by four British newspapers, um, just to make sure we're all on the same page. When I say non-binary, I'm referring, I hope you can read that, um, to one of the mainstream definitions for that, which is a gender identity label used to refer to people whose gender does not fall within the binary categories of man and woman. These are the four newspapers I took into account. So the Guardian, the Telegraph, the Daily Mirror, and the Daily Mail. I looked at their online editions because I feel that they are more pervasive nowadays, perhaps also at an international level. And the corpus includes all articles containing the word non-binary at least once, either in the title or in the body of the text, and published uh, basically in 2021, early 2022. Um, these four newspapers were selected because of the national coverage, because of their daily publication, and um, I'm not sure you can see the table, but it's also possible to look at them from different perspectives uh, based on the fact that they may be called your popular press newspapers, and some people could argue that they can also be like distinguished between left and right-leaning newspapers. As for methodology, um, I've decided to rely on a corpus-based discourse analysis approach. So using Sketch Engine to look at frequencies, collocations, and concordances. I also use the keyword and term extraction tool um, to get basically the list of the most important keywords and multi-terms, which were then grouped into different categories, uh, which were not predetermined. So I actually let the corpus tell me basically what it was about. And the three top uh, topics were gender, celebrity, and show business, and social related issues. Um, this was done by looking at the N1020 corpus as a reference corpus, which includes uh, basically text published online in 2020. And then I used the Siebel corpus for a diachronic analysis. I will be telling you more about this later. Uh, the second part of this project was actually looking at the representation of social actors based on Van Leeuwen, but unfortunately I don't have time for that today. So I will only be telling you about the first part of the project. So um, this is a sort of a summary of what I feel are the most interesting results of the analysis. Um, so just to sum up, the Telegraph and the Daily Mail have a very specific code of practice, which is shared among you know, their area, uh, which says, for example, that people's personal information, including gender identity, sexual orientation, should only be disclosed if they are necessary in you know, that context of the article. While the Guardian has its own guidelines, which basically is a sort of a glossary on how to use specific terms, and the Daily Mirror has no guidelines at all, not that, that we know of. 
Um, you can see that there also are different topics being dealt with. So the Guardian deals with socially relevant issues and show business. The Telegraph looks at socially relevant issues, but from a more institutional point of view, so for example, legal perspective, uh, while the Daily Mail and the Daily Mirror look at celebrities and show business mostly. Uh, what I think is interesting is that they all have a different focus in a way. The Guardian pays a lot of attention to intersectionality. So whenever someone is non-binary and black or whatever, belonging to a certain minority group, and please look at my hands, um, they tend to put a lot of emphasis on that. While the Daily Mirror appeals to our sensitivity, what I mean here is that they mostly report negative news and they give us all the upsetting, if not even cruel, details, so that we sort of empathize with this person and kind of feel sorry for them. Um, then the Telegraph is the one which would seem to be making the greatest effort towards using gender-inclusive language as well as providing definitions, while the Daily Mail is the only one which actually publishes linguistic articles, like dealing with terminological issues specifically. Um, today I will only be, yeah, I was about to forget that, sorry. <laughs> uh, I also looked at whether being a quality or a popular press newspapers or the sort of political alignment uh, was relevant. And being a quality or a popular press is very relevant in determining the topics being dealt with and the language used to do that. So quality press newspapers uh, deal with practical issues of social interest as opposed to popular press newspapers which deal with identity representation and feelings. And here you have the most frequent verbs for each category. So quality press, urge, change, access, need, work, claim, face. Popular press, identify, change, announce, love, support, celebrate. Um, again, quality press newspapers are the most accurate from a linguistic point of view. Uh, however, the Daily Mail is the only one which publishes terminological articles. And in the popular press newspapers, you have a lot of direct quotations, which is one of their how can I say, most recurrent features in general, but when it comes to very sensitive topics, it is on one hand a way for us to access what people are saying directly without any filters, but I feel that it's also a way for the journalists to be sort of relieved of the responsibility of finding the right words, the appropriate words, and to avoid basically hurting people's sensitivity. So this is uh, an example of an event which was picked up by the press in different ways. Uh, in 2021, Demi Lovato came out as non-binary, a changed pronouns to the exam. However, I will be using she, her pronouns now because then she changed her mind again a couple of months ago. So it's more appropriate to talk about her with she, her pronouns. And uh, Demi Lovato is also very influential for people born in the 90s, more or less, because she is known as a singer and an actress as a Disney Channel star. So she is more or less the same age as the fans, which means that she is very eager and talking about what she goes through, her experiences with you know, addiction, rehab, or mental health issues, health issues in general, as well as her coming out. Um, so she's relatable in a way for people. And um, so she published, she published this video on her social media account where she basically told her experience. Um, this is the mail, the Daily Mail. Uh, which basically wrote a very, very long article, like a very long article about Demi Lovato, starting from this coming out as a non-binary person and then going back to all of her career and her history and all of the issues she may have had with gender. And you can see that there also are some clarifications in a way. Uh, they never provide a definition for the word non-binary, but rather for the word pansexual. So what happens here is you have an extract of the article on the right, um, they are recalling a past interview she had at the radio station. Uh, they, Demi Lovato, continued, I don't know, I'm so fluid now. An interviewer, Joe, to clarify, Joe asked Demi to elaborate on the sexual fluidity and whether that means they are pansexual, meaning they are attracted to a person regardless of sexual or gender identity. This is something that the journalist wrote for clarification, because what Demi said is just, yeah, pansexual, anything really. So it would be a bit obscure unless you're familiar with this type of terminology. The Daily Mirror instead um, talks about Demi Lovato and then moves on to all other celebrities who did something similar, so coming out as a non-binary. But they provide definitions. Uh, it's been debated whether this definition is actually accurate. This is sort of a discrepancy if you look at them very closely. 
Non-binary is a definition used when a person feels their gender expression is neither male or female, and people say gender expression and gender identity are two different things, and then they say, binary suggests two opposing identities. For instance, male and female, so non-binary mo means moving away from the idea that there can only be two available identities, allowing room to explore what other identities there may be. So it, maybe it's not 100% accurate, but still it's an effort into trying to help people to actually understand what is going on. And then we have the telegraph, which just very briefly mentions the middle about at the very beginning, like just once. And then they provide a sort of a guide. I don't know if you can read the title of the article, but it says how to talk to teenagers about gender without seeming out of touch. So they're targeting parents, uh, older people probably, who have, may not be familiar with this type of terminology, so they want to help them. Um, and they are actually also evoking a sort of authority in the field, a therapist specialized in this area, Atkins. Um, who says it's also important for parents to know that sexual orientation and gender identity are two different things. Words and terminology are usually important and emotive. Terms such as transgender, transvestite or tranny are outdated and can be hurtful. So you can clearly see what I mean when I say they are making a great effort towards using the appropriate language, not only into using them it themselves, but also into teaching them, uh, you know, their audience, uh, the, the appropriate terminology. Um, and then at the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned the diachronic analysis, uh, which is based on uh, the CIBO corpus comprising articles from 1993 to 2013. And in this, uh, and I actually created a subcorpus considering my four newspapers. And in this corpus, the word non-binary and all its possible variations, so N, B, non-binary with and without a hyphen, it never appears. So I carried out a manual search to retrieve the first article for each newspaper, and you can see that it's basically 2014, 2015. However, I was curious, so I read just a random sample of articles from the Siebel Corpus, and I realized that non-binary people, are basically they fell under the transgender umbrella. So I looked at the word transgender, and it's mainly used, actually exclusively, I would say, for negative news, violence, for social claims, like people fighting for the rights or people complaining that the rights are not actually being uh, respected. Uh, we have no singular they, no new pronouns, no gender inclusive or neutral language, and we do have a lot of misgendering and then naming. So based on our current point of view, we could say that that language is not appropriate. So I'm quickly moving to conclusions because I feel I'm running out of time. Um, so. The point of this very, very short presentation for today is basically to show you that in the binary people, they are being represented by you know, the academic community nowadays. They are getting a lot of attention. And if you look at newspapers, they were represented in the press even before the word non-binary was explicitly used. So things have changed a lot over the last 10 years or so. So we are using first the word non-binary so that you have an identity. Uh, we are using gender inclusive, sometimes gender neutral language and uh, also different types of pronouns, singular day, neo pronouns, whatever we feel might be appropriate for the person we're talking about. And again, uh, being a quality or popular press is very, very influential in determining what is being discussed and how. So maybe this is something that could be uh, given further consideration in the future. Here are just a couple of references and thank you. Thank you, Alessia. Uh, I suppose that we have no time for questions because uh, yeah, Emilia told us, yeah, <laughs> so I'm sorry. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, very interesting. We'll have time to, to ask you maybe afterwards. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So um, it is my pleasure uh, and honor to be here um, uh, for this wonderful, wonderful day and uh, discussions about topics that are very dear uh, and close to my heart. So thank you. Thank you, Emilia, and thank you, Antonio. Uh, so yes, uh, Emilia asked me to, <laughs> to sort of introduce these two sessions uh, somehow, but uh, the first, uh, the, we will have a round table, which will be chaired by Antonio Perri, and then an interview uh, that will be chaired by Emilia. So, um, I just want to say a few words to justify my being here, <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's really, uh, it's about linguistic justice. So, I think this is a concept that is um, really, really interesting, uh, related to uh, obviously to social justice or to other forms of uh, social injustice and inequality. So uh, obviously when we think about languages uh, and linguistic uh, justice, we, we think about the uh, equitable treatment of languages and uh, you know, try to rectify discrimination and inequalities that exist in languages and to build an inclusive uh, you know, approach to, to languages. Um, also, we can think about, for instance, why linguistic justice is significant. So in these terms, we uh, can think about uh, the preservation of languages um, the equity of all languages uh, in terms of preservation of cultural heritage, uh, also the preservation of identity and belonging, so the obviously the um, links between language and identity, which was brought to the fore uh, in today's uh, title for, for today's um, discussions, and access to opportunities. So act, how much access we have to spaces, you know, and to um, obviously the spaces where things happen or in term, economic terms as well. Uh, obviously, we're thinking also about uh, what are the challenges to linguistic justice. So uh, language hierarchies, ideologies uh, of language, um, and also the dominance of few global languages and English, so I'm speaking English, so assuming already that everybody speaks English here. Um, linguicism, uh, so racism, you know, uh, through, you know, an approach, an attitude towards uh, certain languages. So again, the hierarchy of languages and ideologies and language endangerment, and how can we fix this? So I hope you will give us some ideas uh, about you know, language policies, education, media and technology, and cultural awareness. So indeed, this, this title for these two sessions uh, bring, uh, you know, put on the table a lot, a lot of issues. So we're all ears, and I give the floor to Antonio, Antonio Perri. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> I'm not sure that it has been said before because I, I wasn't here. Today is the European Day of Languages, and which is celebrated since uh, 2001. Um, it's by chance, of course, <laughs> but <clears throat> I think it is uh, quite. It, quite mm, 
interesting to introduce a panel addressing uh, an aspect and an issue so crucial in the disputal field of linguistic rights and linguistic justice. Uh, because mm, the problem of standardization is uh, <clears throat> that it, it has uh, many aspects uh, among which there is one aspect concerning the possible uh, mm, actual role of minoritized uh, communities, uh, speech communities, in deciding of their own standards if they decide to have one. Uh, which is always a really problematic uh, aspect. Uh, the title of uh, <coughs> this roundtable is, um, is a copy of the title of a book, a collection of essays uh, of uh, 2018, where uh, the problem of standardizing minority languages, uh, uh, minoritized languages, is seen as a mm, problem of uh, linguistic ideology. Um, why um, um, editors of this essay posit this mm, basic problem at the, uh, at the beginning of the, any reflection about if standardized minority languages, how to do it? Well, because <clears throat> there is uh, uh, the risk, uh, the trap of a sort of uh, double stigma in any process of standardization of a minority <clears throat> language. Why I, um, they, they, say, they say that <clears throat> While promoting a normative standard, a prescriptive standard, um, a code uh, variant of a minority language, should uh, the, <clears throat> in the idea of the proponents, uh, give an identity, give a role, a social prominent role uh, in the territory on the country where it is promoted, the risk is always that such a precity standard is taken as a mark of an inadequate uh, language compared, measured against official natural language. So the stigma comes out another time. You have a standard, but it's less standard than the standard. <laughs> um, this is a risk, of course. This is a risk because uh, mm, we have to think uh, the, the problem, the root of the problem, and that's what I would like to discuss with you. We have to think to the standardizing process as it has uh, conventionally uh, post um, described by classical social linguistics in terms of phases, uh, in terms of uh, institutional, uh, centered, state centered, uh, official, uh, top bottom process or not. That's the point, according to me. I have some suggestion. Uh, for what could be a proper way to standardization for a recently um, recognized uh, uh, Italian language, which is Italian sign language. Uh, but I, I, would, I wouldn't say nothing about it uh, before you. So I, I think you, you should start. Um, I, have, I have said, I was said that Peter Patrick wants to, to, to start, and then I give you a call. Thank you. Can you hear me on this mic? No, not yet. Can we have the mic? Hello? There we go. Okay, great. I won't have to shout then. 
Okay. Um, grazie a tutti, e in particolare a professoressa Emilia Di Martino e Antonio Perry um, per avermi invitato a questo donato di studi. I'm not going to speak today as an academic expert on the topic of standardizing minority languages because I'm not really one. However, I'm going to speak as a lifelong speaker myself of both a majority standard language and an unstandardized minority quote unquote language, drawing on my childhood experience through the lens of sociolinguistics. So one of the hills I want to die on is massively opposing the standardization of minority languages, at least Creoles and Jamaican Creole, which is my second language. It's an emotional position and it may be a wrong position. And if so, I hope to be convinced of it by things said here today. But thus far, whenever I've expressed this view to linguists and creolists, they have either ignored it or smiled condescendingly and moved right on. Um, so uh, my first experience in life is of the educated elite, natively speaking, standard Northeastern white American English in a highly literate home. But aged five years old, my world turned upside down when we moved permanently to rural Jamaica, 1964. Um, my brothers and I walked to the only primary school within 10 miles, um, uh, always the only foreign children in our classes. Um, and in a few years, we went off to the city, Kingston, to a boarding school, all boys. The same situation except for an occasional second language Korean or Haitian boy. Um, a few of our teachers were Irish American Jesuit priests from Boston. Um, and I learned the Creole, of course, uh, with my brothers, not my parents, though they never learned it in 10 years. And I even spoke it with my brothers alongside American English. So from day one, we had already achieved the primary pinnacle of Jamaican education, speaking standard English in a country where 99. 9% of people natively spoke the Creole. Yeah. Now, I vividly remember being called upon in class, probably when I wasn't paying attention, by one of the American teachers, um, and being agonizingly deeply embarrassed that I spoke up in standard American English. Natural enough, linguists might say, and the teachers were probably happy, but for me, it underlined once more that I didn't fully belong to the society and would never be accepted by the other boys. Um, but the point today is not my mistake or my exceptional status, which was quite unusual. Um, rather, it is the linguistic unity of the society uh, in a vernacular language. Jamaican Creole did not stratify the speech community. Instead, that was accomplished, as Renato uh, knows very well um, from his own e experience there. That was accomplished by how much and how well one spoke the standard language, Jamaican English or in my case, American English. The crucial contrast between Jamaica and many minority language situations is that Jamaican Creole, and of course, Bakayad, we call it Patra, but you may call it Jamaican English, okay. Um, is Jamaican English um, is related, uh, historically related to English, the majority language. So that degrees of acquisition of English create a Creole continuum and that not the Creole itself, is socially stratified, yeah. So in my 10 years in Jamaican schools, students were often corrected for getting their standard English speech or writing wrong, but I never once, not once, heard anyone correct their Creole. In fact, I'm certain that teachers did not believe this could be done, as Creole has no rules and was never meant to be written. Of course, linguists know better, we always do, but the rules that we describe in our grammars, and I've written several grammar fragments of Jamaican myself, um, are unknown both to speakers and until very recently to teachers as well. We do not intend them as a stick to beat children with, of course, not at least until the question of standardization arises. And then that is exactly what they become um, via the medium of teaching grammars and instructional materials. So my greatest fear is that the children who have been corrected, criticized, marked down, failed, chastised as morally wrong, and yes, beaten, for their bad English, will in future suffer all the same for their bad Creole. What is there to stop this, given what we know of schools and societies and teachers? Um, I would bet the mortgage that even all of us here have suffered under some teachers in love with authority, happy to wield bureaucratic power, 
perhaps unknowingly willing to play their part in an education system whose main function is to reproduce the status quo, to enforce the class system and the state's view of citizenship and identity at the expense of the majority of children in any school system. So in whose interest really is the standardization of minority languages? Is it really for those children and is it really for their own good? This is my key question. As I say, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not opposed to language planning, language policy, um, acquisition planning, corpus planning, even status planning. I'm not against development of language resources, orthographies, but why should standardization, which is only one of that repertoire, be at the heart of such efforts? Do we really still believe that after giving schools and ministries of education our research and advice and leaving them with a final word in their ear about descriptive good, prescriptive bad, they're not gonna turn around and do the same as always. Um, I'm gonna skip some of what I have here because I prepared 10 minutes and was told five. So I'll try to wrap it up shortly. But we know that standardization is the suppression of natural healthy language variation. Language variation which is required for languages to thrive and change and su survive, excuse me. In history, the standard always loses because the vernacular is passed on by word of mouth and language always changes organically based on the vernacular. But we also know that in social terms, the standard always wins. Its speakers and writers continue to dominate universities, mass media, governments, NGOs, foundations, and even the leftist critics of all these institutions, right? Um, we're here today, all of us, because we were good in the standard language. And we all started school in the same classroom with children who were not and who never went to university. So, I'm gonna skip some of what we know about standard. It's already been well said by, for example, Joan Beale in her talk and others today. But when well-off white educated speakers like me use a standard, the reaction is, that's how those people talk. When anyone else suppresses variation to speak standard, they are also suppressing a key part of their identity, risking a charge of disloyalty to their community. And then if they make one slip, oh, there they go sounding black again or whatever it may be, yeah? So, roughly the same, I believe, for minority language speakers or foreigners using the majority standard. Okay, so promoting standardization of minority languages strongly risks replicating or creating similar systems, mechanisms of stratification in a linguistic context where they don't currently exist, turning a unifying force into one of division. That's the main thing I want to say. I'm gonna skip some other remarks and finish up with, here we are wondering whether or no, let's just hurry on to how to promote standardization for a new batch of minority languages. Um, not the members of this forum, but many other linguists and language planners. But let's think for a last moment about models. How many people here today, and I know Joan Beale was one, have read the texts written in the 17th and 18th centuries about correcting and improving English? Maybe a few of us. But how many have read Shakespeare, whoever he was? Shakespeare, so full of variation of contradictory spellings, clashing dialects, different grammars and registers, old and new. Shakespeare, the standardizer's nightmare. Do we want children to speak and write only the standard or do we want them to be budding little Shakespeare's? Messy, vivid, full of life, common wit, constantly changing their mind about spelling and never being slowed down by it. Teaching grammars, or Bob Marley, Derek Walcott, Linton Queasy Johnson, Miss Lou, Louise Bennett, just to name a few from our part of the world. Tony Morrison, Joan Armitrading, Dolly Parton, vernacular artists who create their work from the common tongue without standard constraints. So as we speak, then inequality slouches towards Bethlehem, riding on the back of the standard. While in the interest of equality, hopefully, the common people march towards the capital on tired feet, laughing, cursing, and joking, which can only be done effectively in the vernacular, as I hope we all know, um, on their way to confront the schools and ministries of education destroy the spell checkers and burn the teaching grammars. Brucha, brucha. Where are the linguists? Who do we support and how do we do it? This is the hill I want to die on. Thank you. I agree. I completely agree with you. I, I have a couple of questions, but I leave for I'm sorry for taking more round. time than I meant to. I tried to cut it down. Uh, On we go. Well, Celia. Yeah, me. Oh, very difficult to speak after Peter. Thank you for that. <laughs> so, um, 
What I would like to raise is basically uh, linked to the case study that I proposed this morning, so the Cook Islands in this case. We started discussing the Cook Islands in the morning as a first talk, and we also went to through some of the aspects of nativization, some of the features that I mentioned this morning. Um, something that we should keep in mind, but more generally speaking, is that many differences uh, from the standard variety of English as native speaker, uh, native language have already become systematic and can already be seen as the features of the, the constitute a new uh, newly emerging varieties rather than errors. So, so something is already going on in, uh, in standard English itself. So even standard English is not standard English they used to be in the past. We should distinguish in the different standard Englishes around the world and see how much of the various forms of variants and variations have been included and have changed all of those varieties of English that we commonly refer to as being the standards. So that's the first point that I wanted to raise. Then second point, uh, going through the Cook Islands and the acrolectal Cook Island English, but not only Cook Island English, also Fiji English and Samoa and some other acrolectal that are there exist and show tendencies of nativization, which are likely to intensify in the coming years. As I said this morning, these, these varieties of English are in the making. So they show traces of other exonomity forces, as we said, the influences from outside, from New Zealand English and some others, as well as nativization. So they are not truly um, stabilized yet. And what we gain in the study so far are only just glimpses of the shapes of them and as they are now and that they're gonna change in, uh, in the future. But if I want to look at them a little bit more specifically, above all in the differences and the differing attitudes of the young and the old generation, as shown partially very briefly this morning in my presentation, towards a local form of, of English, um, show that language attitudes and language uses are changing towards a new model for a national standard which includes nativized uh, patterns. And so while there is still a long way to go, um, it can nevertheless already be seen that if a standard emerges in the Cook Islands, it will no doubt be predominantly based on the acrolects actually concurrently developing on the island. So it's not impossible that national L2 standards will one day emerge pretty soon, maybe later, all over the South Pacific and not only the South Pacific. So the development of new standards, let's say at the periphery, if we want to put it to use a Bailey's uh, terminology, does not necessarily have to be restricted to, to the native varieties of English, uh, but a local standard would be more suitable than an external standard of English to discuss common affairs, public affairs, the workplace language, and other common, common fields, aspects, describe aspects of the local culture, it would definitely be better than an external standard to express the local identity. And I think the local identity is key in that sense. So if we accept, in my opinion, a broad definition of standardness that allows for variation in terms of um, cultural motivation as well, and identity more, more, more openly, the emergence of L2 standards is not at all unlikely to become true very soon, in my opinion. Then there are also other aspects that should be taken into account. For example, the awareness and language attitudes of the speakers on the Cook Islands are pretty much aware of uh, some of them and of the develop although they're not aware as peter said of what the standard is okay so this is something that we share as features we analyze we describe languages and so we know what we're talking about but when it comes to the people in those places they're not aware of what the standard is they're just aware that the language they speak is the language they vehiculate they convey certain meanings that convey their culture that convey their identity Something else, one last point that I would like to raise is also the role played by, apart from the substrate influence, as we said in the morning, but also the language acquisition processes and the education. So what is the education? What's the role of the education? What's the type of rules and norms that we are 
going through in the education. In my corpus, there was a difference between the older speakers and the younger speakers and the middle-aged. And the younger and the middle-aged, they are L1, going towards nativization, L1 speakers of English, is because they are absorbing the norms of the education. The education was primarily brought in the Cook Islands from the New Zealand speakers. So, so this is something else that we need to bear in mind. So the new standard from outside, the external standard has changed from British English and American English into New Zealand English. But at the same time, these are facts unconsciously, the new generation, um, maybe the middle age does not that much influence because of that, maybe for other reasons, as we said in the morning, whereas the older generation have already absorbed the norms that were brought through uh, the education at those times and probably relying on the substrate language and the Maori language much more than the, than the younger generations for a reason. So still a long way to go, but this was the point that I wanted to raise. Right, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we're, you know, providing a lot of um, point views and elements that uh, need to be, uh, you know, dealt with together. So we're raising very uh, critical issues. Then, um, if Peter is, you're not an expert on the on the subject. I have no idea of what we're talking about. <laughs> uh, but I accepted this um, this because I always liked the you know, uh, idea of standardization or disliked. I uh, always like to think about standardization, especially if we, um, if, if we are you know, addressing standardization within the domain of English language. And we think about English. Uh, now, again, I'm not an expert, I'm not an historian, but uh, let's think our source. We're all into English. Uh, I like to think about how long did our English, did standard English um, uh, take to get standardized? So uh, I'm sure the process, totally ignoring my notes, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure the process, you know, started. You, someone, uh, some of you could help me there, but uh, around the 15th century, like 14,000, 1400. So, how did it take to get standardized? Uh, probably first uh, dictionary is Johnson's dictionary, which was, what, almost 400 years after the process started. So I like to think about, you know, the effort of uh, compiling a dictionary uh, and then taking, for, not, not 400 years, but at the end, as, you know, uh, um, the, 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 the result of a standardization process after 400 years. And if you think about Johnson and the end of 18th century, uh, what was happened those days, almost simultaneously, there was another man called Noah Webster, that I'm sure you know about, that was working on another dictionary. So at the end of a, of a very stressful uh, process of standardizing English, we had already uh, other varieties, the emergence of uh, new varieties. We're talking about educated varieties. So emergence of new standards. I'm not talking about only of thinking about North America, think about Australia, uh, think about South Africa and, and, and so on. Um, so the work was done, but it was already history in, in, in a sense. Um, so that's why I like to look at the standardization process as being um, tricky, uh, at least, you know, because you, um, it's, you had, um, you know, um, items who were freezed in a dictionary. Uh, but then as soon as we got to get them frozen, uh, they, they started you know, a new life somewhere else. And so, of course, new encounters with new flora, new fauna, uh, the new, new uh, landscapes forced the emergence of these new uh, varieties. 
Um, so, in this sense, I like to see uh, language as a virus, one of those viruses that as soon as they understand that someone is fighting them, uh, yeah, enact variations. Yes. Um, and now, um, what's the danger here? They feel under attack, I said. What's the, the real danger here? Um, and this is how I ended up conceptualizing standardization in terms of conflicts and tensions uh, between two uh, main drives, if we call, want to call them drives. I had, you know, it was difficult to me to uh, uh, um, end up with a, a, a word that could describe, you know, the need for understanding each other, the need for intelligibility versus the need of expressing our identity. So it's a, we need to understand each other, but at the same time, we need to express our own identity. And this will never, you know, I, I love your hill, and I, I get ill on your hill, uh, and uh, you know, it, it will never, they will never go together. Uh, there will always be tensions, frictions, uh, um, uh, between these two uh, drives. So, uh, the last element I have uh, here is looking at you know the need for identity, and if we look at the standard varieties, uh, if you consider the difference, for example, between what I have mentioned, uh, American English or Jamaican, um, and then you look at the items in a dictionary, or the items also in terms of grammar or, that differ. It's not 50%, guys, it's not 20%, it's, it's only 3 4%, 2% sometimes. So it means that um, it's a very small percentage, I'm not good in percentages as you are, but uh, uh, it's only a very small percentage, but it's, it's, it, it bears a great um, uh, meaning because it's identity there. So it's in those two you know, items represented 2 3%, of the difference between standards, we have our key, which is identity. And this was also to reconnect, in a sense, to our, uh, uh, the, the theme of our today's seminar. Thank you. I'm Francesca. OK. Um, thank you. OK, when Emilia Di Martino asked me to join this round table on minority language or standardization of minority language, I start thinking uh, about what could be useful to somehow uh, to what items would I have to choose to, for, to discuss. First thing, I, as I usually do, I focus on words and I focused on minority and standardization and going through the literature when you focus on standardization and minority the most frequent words are complex reduced limited communities small and large there's no reference to society there's no reference to culture in the first place there's no reference to the difference between oral and written which is relevant for standardization and there's also a um, quite frequent reference to variation and variability. Um, then I focus on the words, and then we call these minority languages, which is not correct. Because if there's a minority language, there is a majority language, and it's already judgmental. So perhaps I start thinking that we might need to restructure a kind of paradigm in which we work because we use categories and concepts that are used to describe spread of language, if we refer to English or other languages, in a moment when it was everything totally different from what it, was, it is now. Um, when we refer to standardization, we refer to a very specific moment in history, politically speaking and historically speaking, when there was a need for some nation states to somehow corroborate their value, um, when they, um, stages and nations were constructing their essence, when distances were really there, 
when contact was difficult. Now we are in a different situation. Distances are reduced, contacts are more frequent. Uh, and language contact in this case, of course. Um, I have all my notes very scattered. And there's also a new idea of society. So perhaps uh, we could start thinking of these processes, not in terms of standardization, because I really don't know what standardizing minority language means. Because minority languages do not exist. If we consider languages considering their functional load, if we refer to crystal, for example, how functionally perfect languages are, can they do everything? Yes, because languages can. So if functional load is one issue, then we cannot say minority versus majority language. If the reference is to the number of people who speak the language, then this is, yes, uh, it's the standard reference. <laughs> it's not standard, that's a different <laughs> idea because number is not re related to the quality of language because there's not such a thing course, as quality course. of language or to the quality of people. Course. So it's a different and it was perhaps relevant historically at that time. So majority versus minority is something that I really don't understand with reference to the languages. Um, if we refer to Gal's um, chapter in the collection, in the collected volumes that we were asked to look at, yes, we can discuss minority versus majority or minority languages in terms of what they do with reference to emotional and absence of emotions, uh, anonymity and all the items. That is okay, so we are looking at languages uh, in the role they might have in the new society, and we are also looking at people. So perhaps, as Gal says, we don't have to look at the standardization and looking at languages, but at the people who speak them, because that can describe what's going on. Um, if we refer to minority languages, um, to languages that are non-verbal languages, like sign languages, then they are usually or perhaps considered minority because they are analyzed using structures and paradigms that are used for verbal languages. And this is pointless. Not anymore. Not anymore, but <laughs> Not it was, anymore. but it's very recent because up to when they were um, claimed as languages, this was a problem. So we were using categories meant to describe languages that were not to be used for different kind of languages. Yes. So my point is, we might try as linguists or as people to uh, uproot this paradigm and rephrase talking about the role these languages have in society, the role that they play for the people in terms of identity construction, uh, emotion uh, displaying, etc. And if we look at this phenomenon from a different point of view, like from an anthropological point of view, there was, uh, there is a book by Don Kulik on the disappearance and death of one language in Papua New Guinea. And he follows this because that was expected. It's like 30 years he has been working in Papua New Guinea to see how a language dies. And the people were the actors of this death, not the language itself. Languages exist because people use them. They are not out per se. So perhaps we can start thinking that there are two levels. One big talk, one language used for variety of functions, variety of context, and where grammar is to be considered, where prescriptivism maybe has to be considered, and then there are other levels of language used, where perhaps ideas come from, where other things are at play, where emotions are expressed, but there's not minority and majority. So maybe we can discuss on the, ro the words we use when we talk about this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I promised to have a second round and I had a couple of questions for each of you. <laughs> um, Patrick, um, first, <clears throat> I suggest that uh, um, standardizing 
language is a byproduct of um, uh, nation state modernity. Shakespeare is out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, I wonder if uh, there is a standard spelling for written Creole. Standard spelling for? For, for Creole, for, for Creole in... in uh, for the written language. The, like, language. If, well, that, if it is used as no, a written language? No, it's not used. It's, it's, not it's used. only used Perfect. by okay. academics, right? Huh? And by a few people who write a newspaper column. Mm. Now uh, we have the Bible. Carolyn Cooper. And now we have the Bible. But I don't yeah. think even that is widely used in no. churches. So right. it exists. It's existed for 60 years. It's hardly known to most people, and it's rarely used. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. And it's rarely used. Yeah. OK. In fact, it was uh, in 2000, I was at a conference in Jamaica, and um, it was put on by the ministry of education and they invited so all the Sanchez, teachers Palestine. and they were talking to the teachers of that language and they were saying things that the creolists in the room i was sitting there with john rickford and one or two others and we looked at each other we've been saying these things for decades they never took any notice finally the ministry was saying it to the teachers of course they didn't mention it came from linguists or anything like that um but uh, we thought it's kicked in now something is going to happen it's out of our control which it always was and we don't know what's going to happen so we'll still find out. Nacho has been there more recently, you'll know. But yes, it's not what you... Yeah. We haven't learned the, the, the system. Yeah. Certo. Okay. Okay, just, just two questions. Um, <laughs> um, um, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, just on the top of my head, I was thinking about, you know, the many different situations I've looked at, uh, Aboriginal English and... Uh, before, um, and so I was also New Zealand, you know, um, Maori English. So they're very different situations, you know, and how much this would affect. So are we speaking about varieties, or are we speaking about languages or creoles and so on? So I think maybe, uh, yeah, could you clarify that? And uh, but I was also thinking about what you said, and it really, really. Obviously, I think um, striked a chord um, because the you know the idea that standardizing you know, uh, obviously, as you said, would somehow uh, be detrimental to identity, so and so on. I I understand, but isn't that a privileged sort of our our view of it? Because I'm wondering just if there are some studies bottom up by minority people themselves what would they think you know what what if we interviewed them would they want that privilege would they want the privileges that a standard brings with them um just that i don't know if there is a study about this yeah i know um there are studies at least to my knowledge both from sociolinguistic point of view, but also from anthropological point of yeah. view, um, because they, um, and generally speaking, um, people are aware and are willing to uh, be part of a larger group sometimes when they refer to what is still called majority language. So it's a kind of conscious or non-choice. So they decide in this case of Papua New Guinea, this uh, language that no longer exists because it was spoken by something like 15 people. So it's a saying it's no longer exist. Um, speakers of this language over 30 years, they chose to uh, become speakers of the other language in Papua New Guinea. So when they were questioned or interviewed, they, at the bit, from what is recounted in books, it's not my research, but they, in first place, were not really um, sure. They were understanding what the question was, because for them was more a social choice. They were living they being isolated and speaking one minority in terms of number of speakers 
language and they chose to go for a majority language to somehow acquire privileges or knowledge. Also access to knowledge is strictly related to speaking one minority or majority language, which on a huge and much wider scale is what happens with English, which is somehow uh, the language that grants access to knowledge and is so widespread and frequently spoken and it turns around. So it is strongly spoken because it grants knowledge and if you want to be, you have to write in English and that's it. We are not talking about English, but from the studies I know people were, it's like it was not that they suffered the death or the language that was a minority one, but they decided to go for the other one. I wonder, I, I agree with you that uh, to use minority is quite dangerous if it implies uh, majority. majority. <laughs> but it's not me, it's the European Charter of Minority Regional Languages that, that decided yes. to, to use this, this, uh, <clears throat> this term. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Is there time to, yeah? Would you, would you like to come here? It's for the people who are online. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for these interventions. I want to agree very strongly with, with your point, sir. Um, I come from the University of Zululand, and it, it, I'm trying to answer your question. It may not answer it directly, but we did have a meeting less than four weeks ago when we were looking at results. I'm in the Department of English, and we are looking at subjects which students failed a lot. English always registers on that because we teach a very indigenous group of students. Surprisingly this year, the indigenous language Isi Zulu also showed up as a language people failed a lot. And it's because our, our preliminary understanding, it's because the South African government is investing so heavily to make Isi Zulu standard and has assumed many of the structures that are used for English, and some linguists have complained about this, that lifting these same structures, these paradigms, into the indigenous languages, it actually made the language foreign to the students, because these, are, these are languages these children use. Now they struggle because now we're using grammar structures, we're using all of that to teach a language which they have been using easily for like 20 years of, of, of their life. So um, it, 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 it makes me remember one, one of the things Renato said when you said how did, has English become standard? I'm going back to Peter's point. Uh, yes, but let's not forget the power dimension. It's not the dictionaries, it's the power. Let's not forget the history of standardization. And so we may not be able to answer your question now to say these are empirical studies that prove that if we take this route, we are going to end up where Peter says we are going to end up. But we do have evidence of how English got where it is today. And I think that that evidence is sufficient to make decisions going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Okay, I have a question for you. Um, so, uh, do you believe that um, language justice is strictly related to standardizing minority language? No, <laughs> of course not. Okay, because that's—I mean—that's what it seems. From now, you know, what, what I think is that uh, what we call standards is no longer a problem now, because we are postmodern. <laughs> it's a slogan, but you, I, I, I hope you, you will understand. What we need now is to protect languages endangered from language loss or language shift. You can call them minorities, and you can try to protect them 
within uh, the frame of a process of uh, uh, recognizing the language from the bottom, from the community, and not from the above, from the state. That's the point. But it, exactly the contrary of the standard procedures uh, taking place during the 20th century. So if you won't change the mind completely, uh, endangered languages, heritage languages, um, immigrant language will disappear. That's the point. You can call them standardizing if you want, but it's another thing. It's completely different. Can you hear me? Yes. No, I mean, uh, the discussion is very interesting and I would uh, actually be so provocative to, to maybe change the title of the um, Creolization the Standard Language, okay. which is what has been going on for at least 100 years. And we still somehow care and question the standardization of the minorities. The minorities don't need to be protected. The minorities languages don't need to be they. Huh? they are, we are already, huh? even the Neapolitans. But this is only to be provocative. I only, it's a long question, it's a question of angle of reading, angle of agency, so many things. I am only wondering if you could very straightforwardly uh, reply to a question, where is linguistics in this position? In the position of um, organizing a round table, uh, and of course it's very valid and very relevant, but I mean in terms of what I can feel from what you are saying is that, you know, there is the life of languages is hybridization anyway. So, I mean, as Agogo was saying, it's a question of power. I don't want to go into the power of the uh, principal languages. I would like to know what it would change in linguistics, in the power of linguistics, to lose ground. Because if you go and look for standard, it is a very grounding base. If you go and accept and acknowledge that the hybridization has been going on for at least 100 years right now, what would that change in terms of the science, the meta-awareness of the science? Thank you. I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer to this question. <laughs> I, I think that Patrick has something. I have one quick thought about that. Thank you very much. I think that's a very important contribution. Um, I think it takes a long time yeah. for academic knowledge to influence exactly. institutional change, if it ever does. So my example of being in Jamaica in 2000, and it was 50 years of things they were finally starting to take on board. I think the linguistics of people like Charles Ferguson, Joshua Fishman, yeah. very excellent linguists and very good men, but in service of a different understanding of politics and justice and institutions than we want to have today, perhaps. That's still contributing to the way that language planning and policy is happening around the world. And we have better ideas now, but when are they going to take effect on how? I think that's important to think about. That's my only thought on it. Yeah, I just wanted to add something about it. You said the hybridization is going on for at least 100 years. I would actually add it's been going on forever. Because if you look at the origins as well, yeah. Yeah, but not only the post-colonial one, even if we look at 
are standard British English and the origins of standard British English. And we go back in time. It was a language content in itself at the time of Jew, Tangans and Saxons and so on. And it was the content that has produced what initially was the initial hybrid form of English and then has developed and been standardized at a certain point. Uh, and we know that even the standardization of British English does not really coincide, it's not exactly the same, has the same features of what is spoken in, in England at the moment. All the dialect leveling in the southeast of England is evidence of how just, for instance, the phonology is totally different from what has been standardized and known as RP uh, for a long time. So variation has always been present and we, we probably don't include it that much as we should. And we don't take it that much into consideration to see how much all of the languages are hybrids uh, of languages themselves. So when we consider that it's more a question of norms, of policies uh, and rules that have been imposed by a minority in that sense, if we want to use minority and majority of people that we should actually look at. Those were, they were a minority that codified English the phonology of English as it was, as, a, as an RP pronunciation at the time, because the, the people, the Cockney speakers, were not using that type of language in London themselves at the very initial point. So, and as I said before, even for the Cook Islands, but it's not the only minority language we should consider. I can think also of the Italians in the UK. They are a minority themselves, and the community is also undergoing a, um, they are endangered, if I want to put it in, in, in that sense, as all of the European um, immigrant languages in, in the UK, for example. But in this case, we need to change the perspective, in my opinion. The perspective shouldn't be from the outside, from the external varieties of English, or standard, the external standards, but an internal standards that should emerge, and will emerge probably at a certain point, with internal rules and taking on more cultural and identity and, and other variations into consideration. Um, if I may add something, um, I don't know what's the role of linguistics so and academics yeah, because it takes ages yeah. for something uh, from no when it's oh. somehow discussed and presented when it somehow affects society. But yeah. as linguists or as people who are somehow privileged to study instead of doing something else, I think we have a um, strong role in perhaps acknowledging difference as a positive issue, making people understand that is, this is part of life, that is, is not to be um, fought, that is not to be judged, it's not the source of behaviors, and we can change also the perspective from which people look at each other or consider each other. So I. And from a more uh, internal uh, linguistic point of view, linguistics could focus on perhaps revise some issues, paradigms, aspects that, are, that linguists have been using so far that perhaps are no longer effective in the society we are living in. So I, I can't see, I'm not able to say that we do something now and it affects reality society because it's not the case. But I think we have the role and we must um, help people who are less privileged, less lucky than we are uh, to show this, that when there's something different, when there is an opposition between minority and majority so far, this is normal in the sense that it goes with life, it goes with human beings with differences um, where we have to start from acknowledging it and explaining because when something is explained and understood it causes no fear so people live with it okay awareness. i think Somehow. are there any questions for the questions no okay i think <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, thank you. So we welcome Emilia Di Martino, our host, <laughs> for an interview with Peter Patrick. And I think I'll just go and sit in the audience. So before I start this interview, let me express my gratitude to, to Peter. Um, well, first of all, for accepting my invitation, okay? Uh, and actually, this invitation was what made this event possible today. And also, um, for, um, you know, because his career uh, has been a source of inspiration. I mean, his, his impact, his tangible, practical impact uh, on the real world uh, has been and is a source of inspiration for many of us here today. Uh, but like I said at the start, <laughs> you know, uh, Antonio and I decided to um, uh, stick to a minimalist approach to in the conduction of this uh, uh, of this seminar. So I will start with my first question straight away. So Peter, in your opinion, what is linguistic justice? And how does it relate to linguistic human rights and to the use of linguistics in the justice system? I mean, forensic linguistics. Very good questions. Thank, Thank you. I, okay, we have this. Thank you. By the way, it's a pleasure to be interviewed, finally. I'm a sociolinguist. I've interviewed scores of people. I've never been interviewed. And Amelia has spent 10 years with me building rapport for this one event. So I'm very <laughs> glad. Thank you. Yes, th those, are, those are very important and quite different things, those three things you mentioned. So maybe I can come to each in turn as we go through this interview. But let me start with linguistic justice, because that's the title of this session. Um, to me, it's a rather vague label, but one that is being used more. Yeah. Um, it's being used more certainly in the USA. Just last week, I saw, I watched a panel put on by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences on that topic, featuring Walt Wolfram, Anne Charity Hudley, Guadalupe Valdez, and others. And of course, linguistic justice as an area of work features outside the USA as well. But within the US, it seems to be used mainly by sociolinguists to refer to how the discipline can help achieve social change and promote justice, both through research and teaching. The emphasis, I think, is on working more and more closely with a speech community, um, not just to collect data ethically, perhaps that's where it began, but also to set the goals of research with a community to um, think about the uses to which the research is going to be put eventually, yeah. and also to collaborate across disciplines. So examples of this include literacy research in low achieving groups, um, lowering language barriers in healthcare, uh, empowering endangered language speakers, and so on. And I have one example from um, uh, Bill above who outlined the connections he saw between African American English and social problems that African Americans encounter. So I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, it's on the biggest one. All right. I'm not going to say much about this. I'll leave it up for a couple of minutes for you to think about. Obviously, there are very, very large problems and issues here of which um, language and even education are only a small but a critical part. And I think that's part of Bill's point in putting this up. Um, so I'll leave that up for you for a bit. So linguists and academics in general, I think we can only hope to come in with quite small efforts compared to the size of problems such as this. And frankly, there's nothing terribly new about such efforts. I mean, Bill Above has been doing stuff in these areas since 1964, I think. Um, what's new is putting social change and justice explicitly in front of research objectives. Mm -hmm and giving members of the speech community speakers leading roles. So I think that is a new thing. That said, and although it's certainly a good thing, linguistic justice seen this way, and, and I'm not, you know, I've only looked a little bit at it myself, I think it's still really focused on the academy. How do we teach better? How do we research better? How do we involve university linguists 
in the communities they research. And the key question here is what happens to the research? What happens to the teaching done by the linguists? So it's a good question, but it's not everything. You started out academic life as a creolist, didn't you? I mean, this <laughs> popped I up. I certainly did. <laughs> Before, but maybe not everyone is aware of this. In, uh, yes. I in did, the audience yes. Here. Uh, I, as I described, I was in Jamaica for 10 years as a child. I learned Jamaican English as my second language, Jamaican Creole. Excuse me. I didn't learn Jamaican English for decades. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I, I uh, studied linguistics in the 1980s and um, before I changed my focus to work on other problems that I'll talk about shortly. So it was growing up in Jamaica that led me to thinking eventually about what we might now call linguistic justice. And I want to thank my teachers, Gillian Sankoff, Bill LaBeouf, Mervyn Aline, John Rickford, also for pointing the way. Um, in Jamaican, in the Jamaican context, I worked on issues like social stratification, the Creole continuum, which I mentioned, urban dialectology, folk narratives, um, lexicography, pragmatics, medical discourse, basically anything that I thought was interesting. Too much for my department, I'm sure. They wanted me to focus on one thing and write everything on that, but I, I couldn't do it. Um, it's fair to say that I always wanted to find out about you know, the linguistic justice issues in the work, but I didn't have a way to do it for many, many years. About 1994, I began to get called for forensic linguistics work. Um, the lawyers call you, you know, and you can't, you have to answer. So, um, uh, and this was for criminal cases involving Patois, involving Jamaican Creole in the US. And about a decade later, in the early 2000s, I became interested in the unique position that Creoles often occupy vis-a-vis -vis linguistic rights or language rights. So. so basically, you would say that, <laughs> I guess, you can say that you began the path to, to, to move uh, along the path of linguistic justice through forensic linguistics. Yeah, I think so. I mean, first, of course, I did the work in, in Jamaican Creole for many years. So um, during my, I spent 365 days doing my research collection for the PhD, as long as they would give me a visa for. And that really brought home to me the whole issues about the ethics of working in a community, especially uh, a dispossessed community, um, community involvement and representation and so on. And later when I had the leisure to write up I always tried to study more, to understand more about Jamaican history, culture, society, anthropology, the legacy of slavery, especially as deeply as I could, because after all, I was a child of 14 when I moved away. I didn't understand these things. Um, and I tried to choose and position my work in positive and useful ways. So for example, I, I explored folk discourses of illness and pain involving both medical healing and folk healing. Um, I worked on a larger project of doctor-nurse-patient discourse in diabetic clinics with a team of medical anthropologists and so on. But I didn't, as you say, I didn't actually think of my work in terms of justice until the lawyers began to call. So let me say a little bit about how forensic linguistics is quite, quite different from the linguistic justice approach to me. It's the use of linguistics within the justice system. And it goes back, I think, to about the late 1970s, as far as I'm aware. Um, it may be research, but if so, it's nearly always applied. And it's applied to contexts where the power of the state is exercised. So the, the state is in charge of the justice system, no question about it, right? From the police to the courts and so on. Um, speech and sign language and written texts in courtrooms, for example, police interviews, police cautions to people who are being arrested, voice identification and author identification, in many criminal areas, threats, fraud, and other language crimes, as my old colleague Roger Shai called it, expert witness work, trademarks in business law, training for judges and police, and so on. Forensic linguistics goes well beyond sociolinguistics, with, for example, a strong phonetics contingent as well. There are journals, there are book series, there are many types of research products, but it's firmly focused on doing linguistics in and for the justice system not the academy. Of course, most forensic linguistics have a regular job at the academy, that's how they can afford to do it, right? But in my expert witness work that I've done, 
the legal aid agency in the UK stipulates that it will not pay for any research to be done. They don't want you doing research, they want you doing the linguistics of the case, yeah? Um, to quote from an institute of which I'm external advisor, the purpose of the Aston Institute for Ling Forensic Linguistics is to improve the delivery of justice through the analysis of language. That's what they have as their motto. So the, the problem with this position of forensic linguistics is that it can only work inside existing mechanisms of the state justice system, which is not always an ideal system, as we know anywhere. Uh, there are linguists who are suspicious of any criminal work that's not done for the defense, um, but I don't see the logic in such positions, and I've also worked with police, prosecutors, and the FBI, which was fun. <laughs> Peter, can you expand on the topic of linguistic human rights? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is something I came to mainly through teaching. I haven't been an activist in the way that many people in the field have, such as the late Tourist Gutnabkangas, who I was thinking of just now in the panel, um, when Francesca said quite rightly um, that people chose the path they took with their language. But I'm sure Tuve would say, but was it a free choice or was it dictated by economics and politics, right? So I, I have taught courses on language rights, both to undergrads and postgrads in Essex and in Moscow for about a dozen years. I prefer to call it language rights because linguistic human rights is the, the name for one particular approach, the approach pioneered by Tuve, Scott um, And uh, most, I would say most scholars and most practitioners agree that language rights is one subdivision of broader human rights. It's kind of a poor stepchild in many ways, but I, won't, I think I won't go into that now. We can think of it as being about those human rights that critically concern language in more than a trivial sense. So freedom of speech is a core human right um, in anybody's book, but it's only trivially about language because you can speak your political or religious or whatever beliefs in any language where freedom of speech is guaranteed. It's not about which language you use, it's about what you say. On the other hand, minority education and the construction of citizenship crucially involve language rights for me because the selection of languages dictates access, as Antonio mentioned as well, for whole populations. So, in fact, educational human rights are a key area perhaps the key area for language rights, although there are others as well. So language rights involve work at many different levels that linguists don't usually get to, most of us, from local government to provincial, state, national levels, to regional multinational uh, organizations like the Council of Europe, uh, Organization of African States, and so on, to the UN, of course. And they, they focus on policy, on legislation, on court decisions, and on international treaties and declarations. Yeah. Um, a lot of academics are involved, but it's largely an area for practitioners, I think, who try to determine what are the rights, to embed them in contexts that are appropriate, to negotiate how they're applied, and to monitor how they're actually used on the ground. And key areas are things like official language status, um, issues of linguistic minorities, as we've been discussing, indigenous peoples and language endangerment, and so on. A lot of work can be done on language rights without being a technically trained linguist. Yeah? In fact, many human rights experts are very aware of language issues in the countries or areas that they've worked in, even though they're not linguists. And in fact, I've often taught human rights students who had no linguistics, and it was fine. It was great to have them in the same classroom with linguists who were very nervous because they didn't know anything about human rights. It doesn't matter. Um, problems for the rights approach, I think, mostly exist on a legal level, and it's very difficult to bring it in touch with daily life. And there are rogue states, the USA, France, Russia, maybe Greece, who prefer to ignore international law and jurisdiction in the way that they understand and apply issues of rights. So how well do you think language rights can help to achieve social justice? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, another excellent question. Um, I guess my answer would be that they're essential to achieving social justice, but they're often not very effective, at least in the short term, for a number of reasons. One of them is perhaps naivete. Yeah? Knowing a right or even framing a right 
doesn't itself bring justice or change things. And many people, I think, are naive about this. Having official language status conferred, maybe finally after hundreds of years, doesn't immediately change things. Rights have to be embodied in documents which either have legal force, legislation, constitutions, court decisions, binding treaties, like the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, or the Council of Europe's Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities, or in documents which have moral and political force, such as the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Yeah? Didn't make any new laws, but it gave a focus and attention to the issues. These documents, which we call instruments, they have to be agreed by heads of state, they have to be incorporated into domestic law and policy, then they have to be applied, they have to be funded, they have to be monitored, and they have to be sincerely and effectively promoted, right? So you can see at how many points it can all go to hell. Right? Um, there are also cases, like I mentioned, the USA, which is well known to be isolationist, which often prefers not to attend to international human rights law, but to work within its own constitution and legislation. Now, this has driven a lot of progress in my lifetime in civil rights for African Americans in the US within the in-country legal framework, but it's done little for their linguistic rights. In contrast, many Hispanics in the US lack citizenship, um, lack civil rights, but Spanish has been reasonably successful in receiving language rights under federal legislation and courts and agencies. So arguably, if the US had been following international human rights instruments which unified the case, things would have been more even in these areas. Peter, what is the role of citizenship in, in, in linguistic justice and in language rights? Yeah, we don't often use the word citizenship in linguistics classes, I think, but I think it's a very important concept for us to think about. In one sense, for linguistic justice work, as I tried to describe it in the beginning, citizenship isn't critical because you can teach or research any population we can access, whether or not they're citizens. But if we look more deeply and historically, I think social change and justice follows the path of citizenship. Were women really citizens before having rights to vote, to own property, and so on? Many indigenous people worldwide still do not possess full effect of citizenship in their countries. And the vast majority of indigenous peoples in the world reside primarily in one country, so they're dependent on one legal framework. Um, this is why the four nations that most stubbornly resisted the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People were. Does anybody know any of them? Anybody? The USA, Australia, and yes, mild-mannered and supposedly progressive Canada and New Zealand, right? These were the countries that resisted. Um, when the great capitalist and colonialist experiment of Atlantic slavery finally failed to be profitable and was therefore abolished, Dozens of countries across the hemisphere face the problem of how do you negotiate the passage from slavery status to citizenship? I mean, a, a huge problem that nobody thought about, I'm sure, before it happened. Um, it is this passage, we might call it not the middle passage, but the final passage, perhaps, um, still incomplete, I think, two centuries on for many people, that literally colors the daily language experience, the lack of linguistic justice and full language rights for many millions of people throughout the Atlantic world, and not just there, Africa and the Americas, but also for people of color in colonial colonizer nations, such as the UK, the Netherlands, Portugal, and probably even Italy, yeah? So, yeah, I think citizenship is a really essential point. What does this, what does this mean then for linguistic justice to refugees, for the language rights of asylum seekers? Yes, you know I've worked on this, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Ciao, Antonio. Um, yeah, in principle, human rights are universal, but of course, some apply only to certain groups. For example, the rights of women, um, the rights of children, the rights of indigenous people. Many linguistic rights are framed for minorities in these instruments. And the category minority has been defined and refined many times in the last hundred years or so. But it's also subject to definition by states. For example, Austria has a very restrictive definition of minority based on laws that existed since the end of the Second World War, before, long before they signed and ratified human rights documents. Their law includes Roma people, 
and certain traditional European groups, but not all. And it certainly doesn't include recent migrant groups, such as Vietnamese people, of whom there are a considerable number, mostly in Vienna. This is very typical of other European countries, but it raises the question, how long does a migrant group have to reside in a state before it's recognized as a minority? 10 years, 50 years, 100, 300, yeah? It depends a lot on how the states conceive themselves. Of course, the USA conceives itself as a country of immigrants, not including the Europeans who came and displaced the Native Americans, but everybody who came after that. <laughs> um, so it's shorter, perhaps, there than it is in Austria, Germany, you know, places with a different idea. The most protected type of minority in general is what they call national minorities. But this category is never defined, as far as I know, in a human rights instrument. Um, it's often realized as a group that is a minority which somehow belongs to another state. So German speakers in Denmark, Danish speakers in Germany. Yeah? Um, typical example. This is obviously a legacy of changing borders because these speakers are citizens of the states they reside in now. Danish speakers are citizens of Germany. So it's not exactly citizenship, but it's linked to it. There's a hierarchy of human rightfulness, if you like, that the Roma, again, if we think of them, they're widely included, included across Europe now in policies and, and instruments. But they weren't always, and in fact, they were very slow to be recognized in many places and are often still seen as not proper or equal citizens with others. So citizenship is not as clear cut and obvious as you might think, and it's not an inclusive guarantee of language rights or human rights for that matter. Unfortunately, refugees, as you asked about, are defined as precisely those people whose country cannot or will not protect their rights. So refugees in the Geneva Convention are people who show a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion in their home country. They have no protection at home and no useful citizenship at all there or in fact in the states where they have managed to reach and, and now live. The Geneva Convention gives them certain rights, but most human rights instruments don't even consider them. Um, and certainly they're not considered as a category for language rights. My friend Otto Santana, a linguist and anthropologist, discourse analyst, who works on Latinx and Chicanos, Chicanas in the USA, is fond of telling me, he quotes Hannah Arendt, and he says, the only human right that really matters is the right to be a citizen, but it's not enough. So yeah, it's, it's a big problem for asylum seekers. In recent years, you have been working with language testing of asylum seekers, sometimes called LADO. Uh, what is LADO and how did this work begin? Okay, um, LADO is actually a term that myself and my colleagues Diana Eads and Micah Verips invented back in about 28 or 9, I think. And we defined it in this way. It means language analysis for the determination of origin in asylum processes. Yeah? We defined it in this way. LADO is a branch of applied linguistics used by governments in processing asylum seekers who are applying for refugee status. Because, of course, refugees have already made the successful first step Asylum seekers haven't got there yet, yeah? Um, of course, this use by governments is also contested by asylum seekers themselves, their lawyers, their representatives, by linguists, other stakeholders and organizations, and that's also LADO. So let me show you another slide here about LADO. Okay. So that has the definition there. LADO was not begun by linguists. It was begun by government interpreters, Scandinavian government interpreters, and then they spun off a company to sell their services to the same and other governments um, for profit companies. Um, and in the process, they expanded from just interpreting to determining where people were from, which of course requires dialectological, sociolinguistic, and linguistic knowledge that they don't have generally. Some interpreters do. I'm not qualified to interpret in court. In my opinion, they're not qualified to do linguistics in court. Yeah, it's a different field. So where adequate linguistic knowledge and expertise is lacking, what happens, folk beliefs rush in, as we know, and they fill the gap and mislead Lotto practitioners, and they help determine the outcome of Lotto cases. Linguists just are not able to um, determine nationality from speech. 
The key questions that we can address scientifically as linguists are about language socialization. Can we say in what speech community, to what kind of parents, et cetera, was somebody socialized? And also, yeah, speech community membership. So this is a linguistic matter. Adequate lotto, again, I say more on the slide there about how lotto works. Adequate lotto demands competent knowledge of linguistic issues. Vernacular speech production, speech perception, language attitudes and ideology, the effects of social context and historical context on variation at a minimum. Yeah, so. So what needs to happen for real progress in that? Okay. Expert knowledge still needed at all levels. Lotto policy, government commissioning of Lotto, because governments buy it in, the eight language agencies that perform it, the government evaluation of the results, and of course, legal processes that determine the appeals and all the things that feed into these. What has happened in the last 20 years? Well, there's been a great increase of awareness um, of the problems and pitfalls of Lotto, not just among linguists, but also in the legal profession and more broadly um, in, for example, the UK, Belgium, Netherlands, and perhaps farther. Commercial agencies compete against each other and this competition has marginally improved their performance, although not so much in linguistic knowledge and expertise as in these sort of professional forensic appearance and production of reports, which is also essential, but yeah. Um, so who's I've, responsible for? Yeah, I put my view of the main yeah. problems about Lotto on a slide. This is a microphone over here as well. Oh, maybe that one, yeah. Yeah, so oversight obviously is one. There's a lack of informed oversight in governments, of course, as I've mentioned. Expertise, I've also mentioned. Lack of basic adequate linguistic knowledge. Attitudes and ideology as well, right? Understanding how they influence and mislead the way we think about language the way people who don't know linguistics think about them. And of course, that includes all the judges, all the lawyers, all the bureaucrats, and so on. Not their fault, but um, especially in languages like Arabic, where folk notions overwhelmingly dominate the way speakers themselves think about the language. You know that um, classical Arabic is the real language and all the local vernaculars are, are wrong and so on. And also the procedures, the legal procedures. In the UK, the Home Office, which does this testing, passes almost no info to the language testers. They don't tell them if a Syrian claimant says she spent 10 years living in Egypt as a child. This is obviously relevant, right? They also don't tell them if they lived all their life in a remote Syrian village. You can't test people without knowing these kinds of things. So the language testing agency can't do a good job evaluating options. So I think, as we've already discussed ourselves here today, the problem with confronting problems of social change and justice is that they are large interlocking problems of which any player holds just one piece, as we saw with the above example, yeah? Lado is just one small part of refugee mm. and asylum issues, and linguists are just one small part of Lado. Mm. I think we might divide the question of who is responsible, mm -hmm. if you ask. And, and how can, can academics? Done, yeah, into three. So can academics are one, um, governments, of course, are one, and the legal system is the third major player for me, and I think probably the leading player, because that's where different ideas get contested, heard, and decided. Governments already have their idea. They don't want to change it. Yeah. Um, and academics, yeah. So again, let me um, show you briefly the, the last few slides. Um, it's easier, I think, for us to to, to compare um, the various things. So what can governments do? Well, governments could seek to improve and regulate all forensic expertise, not just Lotto, fingerprints, whatever. Yeah? Lotto is a tiny part. To ensure the public has confidence, scholars in the fields have confidence and contribute to how well it's done, um, the, the legislature, the judicial, the public, everybody um, can see that it's being done well. 
In fact, uh, there is work um, describing this, these kinds of processes. In the UK, the forensic regulator keeps saying they're going to require peer review and they're going to do this and that for forensic linguistics. It hasn't happened yet. The Netherlands, I think, are ahead of this. They have a register of experts um, which aims to set and enforce standards, but they haven't got around to creating a standard, an ISO standard, as they call it, for linguistics yet. So it can't be done. Um, the Swiss government Bureau Lingua commissioned independent researchers to come in and evaluate to do quality assurance on their lotto process, to criticize them. They weren't going to release the report to the public, but they wanted to know, could it be improved? And does it comply with the guidelines that myself and 18 other people wrote a long time ago? Um, if anybody knows Tim McNamara, a wonderful mm -hmm. Australian mm -hmm. applied linguist, he was one of the leading people on this review. Tim just died last week, unfortunately, and I'm sure we'll all miss him very much. Um, the Swedish Migration Board requested in independent investigation by a former cabinet minister, chief judge, famous guy, and his report called for significant changes in how Lado is done. So governments can make things better if they want to or if they're forced to, right? What about the courts? Um, oh yeah, we also have NGOs which can help. The courts can rule on how a national regime uses Lado, but once a pattern gets set in one country because of precedent and so on, it's very hard to change it. So it's got to be done early and right, I think. Um, government bureaus have been accorded expert status in court decisions in the UK. In the Netherlands, independent units like Detail Studio of recognized quality had to get money to fund legal challenges for time after time for years before the court finally said, yes, you too have expert status. They have much better experts than the government, but it took years and money to make that happen. Um, the courts can draw a distinction between interpreters and linguists and say interpreters should interpret, linguists should do lotto, right? This would be very helpful. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights ordered the Netherlands authorities to allow new recorded evidence. Previously, you could only use the government's interview with an asylum seeker, which is often really poor data. The linguists would shudder at how bad they did, how bad a job they did of collecting data to make a decision. So can you get new evidence from the same asylum seeker? Yes, now you can. In the UK, um, one of the main suppliers, for-profit Swedish suppliers, was found to always have high quality and should always receive very considerable weight in cases by the um, appeals court for England and Wales. Many of the asylum lawyers were aghast at this and all the linguists as well. We couldn't believe. Um, in 2013, the Scottish appeals court differed. They said asylum expert reports should be as rigorous as those in criminal cases. Yeah, why not? It sounds reasonable. Um, the Home Office had to go to the Supreme Court to review this. I think I mentioned this was in process 10 years ago when I was here. <laughs> then it happened, and the Supreme Court said the earlier decision was misleading. Um, it wasn't critical enough. Linguistic analysis should be better explained by the company. How can they establish people's origins with such certainty? Some of the testimony was wholly inappropriate and wasn't coming from experts. It sounds great. But unfortunately, although they overturned the cases denying the asylum seekers, they didn't require the asylum tribunals to change. They politely invited them to reconsider because the Supreme Court decision was written by a former head of the asylum tribunals. So he was being nice to his colleagues. Ten years on, they still haven't taken up this invitation to change things. Um, however, other things happen that you can see on, on the slide. So, then what about linguists, right? What's the role of linguists? Well, this is a very slow pace of top-down improvement, right, that I've shown you there. What can individuals do? Some of what linguists could do is business as usual for us. Do the research, the kind of research we know how to do with populations for whom it's useful. For example, as you might guess, there's a lot of Syrians being uh, interrogated through Lado in the last 10 years. Before that, we had many people from Somalia. Now, we know a lot about Arabic. We know a lot about Syrian Arabic among linguists, dialectologists. So we can do that kind of work. For Somalia, we couldn't do a good job because there was very little recent work. We need better, newer studies of Somalis, Somali language, right? Um, the other thing we could do is think of new research that would contribute to this area. So we don't know much about how convincingly people can lie in general, in forensic linguistics in many languages. Governments are paranoid that asylum seekers 
are fooling them. They say they're from Syria, but they're really from Egypt, yeah? Let's do some research on how well people can pretend to be from Syria when they're native Egyptian speakers. We will find out. We could use it in these cases. So you could also do more committed linguistic justice type approaches um, or forensic linguistics type approaches. Authoring reports as I do or working with organizations to develop standards, creating networks to influence policy and practice. Our universities like us to do those kinds of things, I suppose, mm -hmm. but it's not easy to do. Developing standards and guidelines. All of these things take time and what I would say to finish perhaps is, finish this bit, is that um, uh, the investment of time that it takes to learn about how the asylum tribunals work, how um, law in this area is decided, how other agencies in other European countries do their jobs, et cetera, is considerable. I mean, it took me years to get adequate in my reports as far as I'm concerned. Um, our universities and employers don't always value the time it takes to learn the surrounding context to create social change. So it has to be something you're interested in, you're secure enough to do, you're fortunate enough to, to make time for somehow. And yeah, that would be the last bit of that. Can I give do, you the, the last question? Do, do, do you have any suggestion for academics who are just starting out in this field? Yeah, I mean, one is be lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I was lucky to have a secure position in the middle of my career, not late in my career. My university didn't think any of this stuff was important. Um, they thought I was doing it in my spare time, but I could do it anyway. In fact, I stopped being evaluated for research 10 years before I retired. I said, I'm not gonna do that anymore. I'm just gonna teach. And I worked for my union. I was union vice president for a long time. And they couldn't say no because I, I had a permanent position. Right? So I was able to do all this work and then impact came along and they realized they could get institutional funding for research that produced impact. And here I was doing impact, so all of a sudden they liked me again, you know? So I was lucky in that way. But also I think it's useful for us to think at the end or 20 years after the end of our careers, when we look back and think, what did I do with all my working years? What's going to make me happy to have been involved in? What am I going to be proud of? What am I gonna wish I spent a lot less time of? I can think of many things of my own I wish I had spent less time on. And just think, okay, let's do the things that make me feel confident, feel satisfied about having done good work and do the best you can. That's, that's an obvious thing to say, but we don't always, we get a lot of pressures in work that don't allow us to do those things. And I think for people early in their career, that's an important thing to hear, that you can do things that will help. It may take 30 years, but you've got 30 years if you're young, right? <laughs> so finally, if you could rub a lamp or wave a magic wand and create any new language rights, what would you, be, what would you wish for? Yeah, that's good. Um, <laughs> well, so I've suggested that language rights aren't always the best solution. And also it's difficult to create new ones formally. But I think there are a couple of basic things that are not really encoded in human rights instruments that I think are really important. And I'm sure we, we'll probably all have our own ideas. Um, one of them is simply the right to be heard and understood. My time with Lotto work has suggested to me that asylum seekers are an extreme example of how difficult it can be for people simply to be heard in their own language, in their own voices. And I'm sure we can all think of other good cases for that. People are simply not listened to by institutions and their languages and their voices are erased and ignored. The second thing is similar. It's the right to tell your own story. Yeah? Um, your story, especially if your story in your own words is the only defense you have. And for most people seeking asylum, this is the case. Um, the only defense you have against suspicion by a powerful state, the only chance you have of achieving safety, you have to be believed, yeah? It amazes me how hard it is for people to simply have their narratives accurately recorded, accurately interpreted, not distorted, not erased, and then fairly judged. So not just for asylum seekers, but in general, 
when we do interviews in communities with people in our research. What are the people's stories? Let's be fair to them and be accurate and listen to them. And finally, the right to have your language respected, especially by those who are in power. This one speaks for itself. And I think it joins up all the threads we've been talking about. Language testing, asylum seekers, forensic linguistics, the emerging practices of linguistic justice. So, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this beautiful interview. I think your, uh, you know, your, your passion, your experience, your authenticity has inspired many budding linguists today. We have some uh, MA and uh, BA students um, you know, listening to this from remote. Uh, we have early career uh, academics here uh, in this room. And, and also it's been, you know, food for thought for uh, all of us here today. So really, thank you. I'm really grateful. And I think all of us are grateful for uh, your contribution today. Thank you so much. <laughs>We can be the three of us. Do you mind Sorry. to be the three of us yes, from the time? Yeah. yeah. So Should we be all right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Are you are you ready? And see, si. non c'è la la terza persona. La terza persona. Uh, uh, is it here? Chi chi is it? Okay. It is my great pleasure to introduce this uh, next uh, session on ethnical identities in language. And our first speaker is Agongo Akpome, who is currently based at the Department of English, University of Zululand, South Africa, where he is an NRIF rated researcher. His teaching focuses on post-colonial African literatures in English, as well as literacies and language. He also works in the area of decolonization, discourse, representations, literary historization, narratives, and so on, especially in relation to Africa and African subjects. His most recent article discusses the depiction of black African refugees in the wake of the so-called European migrant crisis. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks, colleagues, uh, for staying with us till so late. Um, so I've um, changed the title a bit. I just put this uh, like a prefix which is a quote I took from one of the texts that uh, I analyzed. Uh, we, couldn't, we would communicate with our hands. Who can understand their language? The European refugee crisis and the reimagining of African identities. So this is from a project that uh, is winding up. Uh, I've done the major legwork and I'm publishing in bits out of it. It was titled The European Refugee Crisis and the Reimagining of Africa. Uh, the background to it was the, as we all know, the so-called uh, crisis of uh, 2015, 16, 17, 
and how um, and it continues it seems to have researched now again how it anim animated discourses in 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 the u.s um, and across europe in particular uh, but i remember when we were doing this initially in 2019 remember the those uh, infamous words uh, ascribed to former u.s president perhaps the next u.s president as well i don't know <laughs> about how uh, Africans live in huts, and why Norwegians aren't coming to the U.S. And why is it Africans coming to the U.S.? So the the project, uh, I examined texts across genres. Um, the Go When Gone is a 2015 novel by Jenny Eppenberg, German novel translated into English. The Jungle is a play, staged immersive theater, but published as a as a book as well by British playwrights Joe Murphy and Joe Robertson, uh, based in the former migrant camp in Calais in France. And then I had focus group interviews in several cities in Europe, in Naples, in Copenhagen, in Berlin, in Frankfurt, and in Lampedusa as well. Uh, there was also a personal interview in Lampedusa, and I examined a documentary which reports on the Itali in the Italian scenario, It Will Be Chaos by Lorena Luciano and Filippo Piscopo. One, I don't have time to go into details, but one of the key things that was in, in, in my mind in this project was how active is the colonial archive, the colonial repertoire, in terms of how Africa and Africans are imagined. I think of imagined rather than perceived. Uh, I think of imagined uh, as having greater texture, greater qualitative texture, uh, instead of perceived, which is a term that is associated with, uh, you know, a lot of these quantitative uh, studies. Uh, when they see, when, so the thinking is this, in what ways did the movement of refugees, asylum seekers, migrants, I wouldn't go into disagree, um, disambiguating those terms here. In what ways did it affect? Did it affect, and if so, how? Did it affect what we may term common um, reimaginings or reimaginings of Africa, of Africans? So how does Africa figure in the European imaginary in re response to or in the context of that um, that 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 so-called crisis, and interesting how the world world goes around. I'm reminded of the metaphor used by recently. I think that was in October of last year by one of the top European uh, diplomats uh, about the jungle and the garden. How Europe is a garden, and and how the garden has to be protected, and how the rest of the world is a jungle. Yeah. All right, so these are the texts I looked at initially. It Will Be Chaos is a documentary film, Italian, Italian filmmakers, based in the US, of course. Uh, and, and, and the documentary is, is, um, uh, focuses on Italy. Um, of course, Jenny Eppenberg, German writer, Go Went Gone, based in Germany, in Berlin, The Jungle, the things that happened in Calais, the former Calais migrant camp that was uh, sacked uh, in 2016. So when I looked at when I looked at this, uh, uh, what I was doing was just looking. I was just searching these texts to find out which words and and this is particularly for this seminar because we're interested in identities and language. Which what kind of language, what specific words are used when the producers of these texts conjure the African subjects. How do we encounter the African subjects in this text? What associations can we make? What do these words invoke? To what extent might we say these invoke the colonial um, archive? Um, how does it depart from it? So that's just what I did. Um, and I find in this, in this documentary, the first encounter 
is the shipwreck reporting like a live reporting of the shipwreck in Lampedusa, the 2013 shipwreck, which many of us may have been aware. And the direct references to the subject, to the African subject, these are the direct sentences. So you see, I, I can't use the videos. I, I, I've not been able to put them in the slides. So you see a casket, number 28. You see another casket being airlifted with a crane from a, a ship that is docked onto in the harbor. Then you hear the words 350 corpses, and then you hear 518 asylum seekers. It interests me that these numbers in this documentary are the first labels, are the first words that are used to make reference to the, to the asylum seekers. Uh, and then you hear, you hear the signal tune of the BBC World Service in the background, and then you hear you know, that very sonorous uh, news uh, presenter talking about mostly Eritreans and Somalis. Up till the fourth minute of, of the movie, that's what you see. Then another interesting scene is where the former um, mayor of Lampedusa at that time, I think it's Nicolini, she's having an interview with uh, one reporter and she says, quote, let's make it clear, those who land in Lampedusa aren't illegals. Words are very important. I have to correct you, otherwise you report that these are illegals. If you don't get it, neither will your audience. Uh, interestingly, one of, the, one of the fishermen who helps salvage some of the, of, the, of the drowning asylum seekers uses those terms, but a very well-intentioned person, you know. Uh, later on in the, in the, in the, in the documentary. Uh, I just find interesting that the filmmakers decided to foreground this, and very interesting that uh, the mayor decided to foreground it, to tell the reporter, to not wait for the reporter to report, but to say, take note, they're not illegals, and just signals to us how important it is. For me, for the purpose of my research, just tells me how the people are seen, how they are perceived. Uh, uh, not so much as perceived, but how they are imagined. They, they, they are seen as illegals by some. Um, but what might be very interesting for this seminar is, is the last uh, sentence. We would communicate with our hands. Who can understand their language? I find this very interesting because it, re it reappears in Go Went Gone. It's a novel produced in Germany at some other time by another person. Fiction. So we're moving now from a non-fiction text uh, documentary to a fictional novel. And one of the characters, so there's a protest by this, actually a real protest that, that becomes uh, fictionalized in this novel uh, at uh, Orianan Platz in Berlin. And one of the characters, they speaking to, um, to a, a, a journalist and he says, they, meaning the, the black African migrants, they speak English, French, Italian, as well as other languages that no one here understands. Emphasis mine. So it's interesting to me how the, the fellow moves from knowing which languages these people speak and then going on to conjure the babelic image. Who can understand their language? Reminds me of the guy, the fisherman. And, and where, where I find this, and that might be my problem, but, but it somehow conjures for me the scene in Conrad's Heart of Darkness. The yelping, who can understand them? The idea, I think it's difficult to not remember the idea of the polyglot Africans speaking languages that can't be understood. And that's where the first, um, what I highlight in red means. So there are languages that can be understood, English, French, Italian, but then these also speak languages. The unknowability, it suggests to me, uh, these people can't be known. Then Eppenberg uses the color scheme strongly, and, I, and she's doing it for a reason. My analysis of the novel is that, and of all these, of the three texts that I analyze, is I can see a strong, a very foregrounded, well-intentioned desire to humanize. So uh, you can't fault the producers of the text in terms of what they are doing. But I think they enter into murky waters because they are trying to invoke stereotypes and I think trying to undercut the stereotypes. So the extent to which they are invoking the stereotypes in order to undercut them, or they are perpetrating the stereotypes is where it becomes a bit tricky. 
So she uses this, their skin is black, but, and I think this is a very mimetic re representation that she does, that's my, that's my conviction, um, is she's attempting to enter into the mind of, of her fictionalized characters. Uh, so this recalls their skin is black, the men with dark skin, black and white people, the dark skin men, the men with dark skin. Uh, this is, Woods is not, is not Eppenberg, is a reviewer uh, of the, of one of these texts, I forget the specific one now, pardon me. And um, that's, that reviewer also says dark skinned. It's an Italian reviewer. And in, 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 in Woods, in um, Eppenberg's novel, there's also one of the characters who said, that, but then this now is in Italy. So this is a, a German couple who traveled to holiday in Italy. And one of them is reporting that they come across out in the middle of nowhere, we see all these black women, Africans. And I find this also at in Go and Gone. For a long time, the old man and this young man, quote and unquote, sit there side by side at the desk, waiting and listening as these three musicians use the black and white keys to tell stories that have nothing to do at all with keys. So a lot happens with Eppenberg's central character. He begins to befriend, he's a retired um, a German professor. He begins to befriend these black asylum seekers. And he gets very close to this one. And this is the description. He's kind of your central focalizer in the novel. Uh, and I see Eppenberg now moving away from the black and white schema, from the color schema, to old and young, uh, which, which signals that she's doing something with it all along. And then she talks about, uh, she begins to, to highlight other ways of seeing the difference. I think she's looking for a creative way to foreground the difference without relapsing into the stereotypical color uh, uh, schema, the, the othering schema. And then she talks about, is it a rift between black and white? And you see that black and white are capitalized between poor and rich, stranger and friend, or between those whose fathers have died and those whose fathers are still alive. So I, I think she is suggesting other ways of conceptualizing, of imagining the difference. The novel, uh, Richard, thinks heavily, uh, heavy inter interior monologue on differences and differences that transcend uh, the, 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 the color divide. So uh, I find that a very powerful novel. I find it very helpful. Uh, okay. I find it very helpful. And I think it challenges us to think about a difference in several ways. I also think it, it foregrounds the role that our vocabularies, our grammars play in, in, in the way we imagine the world, especially the other, not just the African other. But I find that it's from this text at least, and from what is happening again, especially with this guy's recent October 2022 metaphor of the garden and the jungle, I find that the colonial paradigm, the colonial way of seeing things, the othering, the adversarial other, the hierarchized other, the inferiorized other, remains a powerful way of seeing. Um, even even when the artist, in this case, you think um, um, Eppenberg, I don't have time to go into the, into, the, into the play, even when the artist attempts to undercut these uh, uh, binaries, these stark binaries, they tend to end up with other forms of binaries. And, you know, Binaries that remind you of uh, George Bush's infamous axis of evil, the good guys versus the bad guys. Uh, so I think we're going to be living with this for quite a while. Uh, these are the thoughts that I have. Wakobiro is how to say thank you in my native language, which is spoken by 2 million people in the Niger Delta of Nigeria. <laughs> Ngabonga is how to say thank you in Isi Zulu, spoken by 22 million people in South Africa, where I currently work. Um, and in Italian, it's grazie. Thank you. your presentation uh, you give us much food for thought but unfortunately we don't have time for questions so uh, our next speaker is uh, Silvana Carotenuto 
eh, professore, io preferirei dire professoressa ordinaria presso l'Università di Napoli l'Orientale dove insegna letteratura contemporanea di lingua inglese e dirige il centro di studi postcoloniali e di genere. I suoi campi di interesse sono la decostruzione, le créatures féminines, gli studi culturali, postcoloniali e visuali, tra le sue pubblicazioni la lingua comune in Zondinus e Philip, svolte traduttive, Cosmopolitanism and Cosmopoetics, The Cultural Migration, Our Concept, il libro in cammino di Jamaica Kincaid nel Paradiso Reclamato, scritture migranti, Events of Thought in Chinese Contemporary Female Art, in False Work, Small Talk, Political Education, Aesthetics Archives, Recitations of a Future in Common. E io le chiederei se possiamo uh, chiudere qui questa presentazione in maniera tale da poterle no, permettere no, eh, poterle Scusate, lasciare eh, la parola. Grazie eh, a lei la parola. The floor yeah. is yours. Uh, posso, can I have the PowerPoint? Oh no, I need to... Oh, yes. Thanks very much for the invitation. Thanks for being here still at half past five. Thanks, Agogo, because somehow, oh, where is Agogo? Or maybe left. Anyway, um, I don't believe I need to explain the choice of my topic. I teach and I have been teaching postcolonial literature and female. Uh, writing for many years. So when I was invited by Emilia and uh, Renato, I could not help but deciding to speak of the immense work that the Nobel Prize Toni Morrison has produced in the field of language and identity, writing and blackness with their strong, uh, remarkable emphasis on the specific question of the gender of her writing. Uh, of course, if we had time, I would deal with the amazing novel Beloved, and even more relevantly for our gathering, with the extraordinary lecture she offered at the Nobel Prize celebration. A piece of inspired writing that voiced Toni Morrison's reflection on the decay or the death of language today. Its abuse, the looting, carried out by the nefarious purposes of power that render a language dumb, predatory, sentimental, a language of surveillance and domination. Toni Morrison, of course, countersigns all these and much more with the complex and necessary advocation of the beauty of language, its generativity, the creative force that it can and must provide for the black community, which is absolutely the one that Morrison addresses all the time, but also to the humanity of the ones who care about and worry for the violence of the past, the rise of fascism, racism, and sexism today, in the hope in a future of justice for all of us. There is no time, I only have the chance of dealing with the short story, Toni Morrison's only short story, written and published in uh, 83 in the collection of writings edited by Amiri and Amina Baraka, Confirmation, an anthology of African-American women. The, this little short story has been, uh, was republished in 2022 with immense international echo as a little book with introduction that in Italian uh, became a post-preface signed by the pre British writer Zadi Smith. Resistative is the story of the friendship of two poor girls, both more or less eight years old, who are initially sent to an orphanage. Just because Tila has a pretty but irresponsible mother and Roberta has a mother who is too ill to take care of the child. 
the story, the recitative that indicates the tone or the rhythm peculiar to any language is narrated in five parts. The children's experience at the orphanage, the time they meet again eight years later, then after 20 years outside the school in New York where they both are demonstrating but from opposite political stance, finally in a coffee shop on Christmas Eve. Recitative narrates the racial, economic, and hierarchical differences between the two first girls and then grown-up women with some intimate traumatic issue that seems to mark the lives of both, constituting the hidden thread of their complex friendship. We know from their entering the shelter from the very beginning of the short story that they are from a whole other race, like salt and pepper, says the narrative. But we will never know which race is which. One girl cannot remember what she reads, the other cannot read. They are both set apart from the real orphans. They are not orphans. They are only rejected by the mothers. Um, and they are also somehow set apart from the older girls who keep scaring, but also attracting them with their bullying attitude. These girls enjoy tormenting one girl in particular, Maggie, the kitchen woman with legs like parentheses, the one who cannot speak, the one who is mute, who produces only tears, no cries, the real outcast among them all, who keeps falling and hurting herself. Maggie is the secret lying at the heart of the two girls' relationship. I cannot tell you in detail how they grow differently, how they witness the difference in their status and class. What I can briefly tell you is that when they gather at the end of the short story in unity again, they confess the secret that has been haunting them and us with them. Oh, shit, Tila. Shit, shit, shit. What the hell happened to Maggie? Just a few lines before, Roberta has already explained. Listen to me. I really did think she was black. I didn't make that up. I really thought so. But now I can't be sure. I just remember her as old, so old. And because she could not talk, well, you know, I thought she was crazy. She had been brought up in an institution like my mother was, and like I thought I would be too. But you were right. We didn't kick her. It was the guard girls, the other girls. Only them. But well, I wanted to. I really wanted them to hurt her. I said we did it too, you and me, but that's not true. And I don't want you to carry that around. It was just that I wanted to do it so bad that they wanting to is doing it. The responsibility in desiring, saying, lying, in using language at the expense of silence, to employ language at the cost of the ones who have no language. Language does what it thinks, says, and desires. It has consequences, as remarked by the epigraph quoted at the very beginning. She thinks of language partly as a system, partly as a living thing over which one has control, but mostly as agency, as an act with consequences. In my view, this is what Toni Morrison has been articulating in her whole poetic career, what she has magnificently expressed in her Nobel Prize lecture. It is, however, not what Zadie Smith understands in her reading of the short story. In the article that she published on the New Yorker, that then became the introduction in Italian, the post preface, and that was called The Genius of Toni Morrison's Only Short Story, she proposes that recitative withholds 
crucial details of racial uh, uh, identity, making the reader the subject of her experiment. Smith offers indeed a piece of remarkable close reading from the title to the development in detail of the story. Her obsession is, however, to find out who between the two characters is black and who is white, searching for a clear answer into the details of their black and white American speech, referencing to what they hear, what music they listen to, what they eat, their life, their position at work. Reading the text with my students, MA or undergraduate, we found indeed that Zadie Smith's critical perspective is and was somehow manipulating. She keeps referring to the readers as we, we urgently want to characterize, we learn, we listen a little more closely. We might think, we will assume, we will hear, we will not be able, we really wanted to, we tend to use, we will see, we might think, we are informed, we know. I could go on quoting many, many other persistent instances of this assumed, un undebated, unproblematic, granted we, in Zadi Smith's interpretation. Together with my students, and possibly this is what I offer you as a matter of discussion, but there is no time, I believe Toni Morrison's oeuvre is exactly inspired by the deconstruction of this essential and also somehow suffocating weed, thanks to a poetics, which I normally write as poetics, the ethics of poetry, uh, but here is the poetics of language that wants to experiment with the substraction of all racial codes from a narrative about two characters of different races for whom racial identity is crucial. This is, in my view, the freedom of poetic language, the freedom of writing, the freedom of literature, the claim of freedom that Toni Morrison offers to the singularity of her readers through the grace of her unresolved complexity. And I do believe that she would never allow anybody to limit such creative openness. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for this talk. Unfortunately, then again, we don't have time for discussions. It's a, a real pity, what, but we have our next speaker, Tesi Moitra, holds a PhD from Università degli Studi di Napoli Orientale. She has master's degrees in English literature from San Luis University. Uh, Madrid campus and contemporary art from the Sotheby's Institute of Art in London. Her research interests include post-colonial studies, linguistics, gender studies, and contemporary art theory and criticism. She has published several articles and essays on the same. She is currently teaching at Suor Ursula Benincasa University in Naples and at the American University of Rome. The floor is yours. Yes. Without dropping the water, preferably. I hope you can hear me, yeah, I think so. Okay, I wanted to begin by thanking Amelia, first of all, both for organizing this wonderful event, which I think has been a roaring success, so many thanks to you, Amelia, and for giving me the chance to present my work today. So that was um, what I wanted to start with. Um, I would like to highlight that this presentation is part of a wider research investigation that deals with nostalgia and the diaspora and the way the two interact through the television series, A Suitable Boy which is based on the book by Vikram Chit. I wanted to leave some time for questions and dialogue, so rather than use up all the 15 minutes, I will present for just over 10. So if you can tell me after 10 minutes are up, because I, I would really like to have uh, some time to talk. So I don't know why this is shaking. OK. This paper probes the idea of nostalgia, investigating the term, and most significantly, its ramifications on the South Asian diaspora. 
Rather than a passive thing looking into the past, nostalgia assumes a dynamic malleability that influences all temporalities, past, present, and future. I argue that it is through the performativity of nostalgia emerging from cinema that separate sort of narratives emerge, not distinct from, but rather intrinsically a part of the overarching diasporic community. The intense deterritorialization of cinema in space profoundly affects the diasporic gaze and renders forever, forever unstable the play of metamorphosis. The polysemantic ambiguities involved in who is telling which stories and how, and perhaps most significantly of all, what the manner of engagement with these stories is, underlines the exigency of investigating the cinematic conversation with a multi-layered, dispersed cultural identity within the context of its representation. Trying to understand a polymorphous concept like the diaspora is problematic at the very outset, and its meaning has expanded since its original use in the classical sense that referred primarily to the displaced Jews and Armenians to now include a much broader range of those intercontinental communities that are located virtually, physically, and even mythologically in place and time. In many ways, the diaspora today typifies the shifting plates of identity politics, and to begin to grapple with a concept that resists being bound to a specific demarcation, one has to conceive of the diaspora as being fundamentally polyphonous in nature, wherein the autonomy of the self existing within reciprocal connections to the social network stakes a valid claim to individual reality. The individual experience of the diasporic subject is unique and undisputed, and yet there is almost a sense of urgency to probe the nodes and points of contact of this spread out and indeed rhizomatic. Um, I hesitate to say identity because it's so much more than that. <laughs> so let's just leave that as a, a sort of an ambiguous lack of, lack of word where a word should be. Um, it has been said that the diaspora is destined to be a trope for nostalgia, a statement that acknowledges the sense wherein the diasporic subject, Janus-like, looks simultaneously back to a past, oftentimes unknown, and forward to a future yet to be lived. In order to consider this bond under the conditions of the evolving nature of the diaspora, whose hyphenated and migra migratory cultures develop different structures of experience, a changed conceptual language is required, and one has to pu push the proverbial envelope to further consider questioning, when viewed through a cinematic lens, what is at stake when one repositions the diaspora-nostalgia relationship in a way that problematizes the understanding of this connection? And furthermore, what are the consequences of such reordering? The focus of this article is not to offer a reductive social-cultural analysis of the interplay between nostalgia and the diaspora, but rather to put forth, forth an alternate manner in which, viewed through a cinematic spectrum, one can contextualize that relationship, especially in terms of its ramifications on the multifaceted, and dare I say fragmented, diasporic creature, identity, character, person. Um, wherein the diasporic subject seeks a kind of reconciliation through performative moments and gestures. Expressly, I argue that through the cinematic experience, nostalgia takes on a kind of performative dexterity, which irritates the diasporic consciousness and raises a host of epistemolo epistemological and phenomenological concerns about um, the contemporary diasporic identity and the representation of that identity at the borders of the real and the imaginary. Resting on the fine line between the illusory and the real, we have the work of Mira Nair, the way she has presented um, a suitable boy in the miniseries. Um, and the illusory and the real, considered as, com as, as concepts, are complex in and of themselves, but even more so in a diasporic context, where the real and imaginary are not contained units to begin with and are always influenced by a nostalgic longing for a past that runs the risk of being ever more romanticized by the imaginary and the mythic. This complexity is further intensified because an actual reconciliation with the past is impossible due to the very definition and nature of the diaspora. And it is through nostalgia, imagination and myth-making that a sense of cohesiveness is attempted to be recreated. 
The wrestle between the real and imaginary time and space and the performative gesture of cinema that engages with nostalgia as a means of quasi-resolution is seen throughout the series A Suitable Boy. The overpowering desire to forge a kind of unification between the two ideals, the real and the imaginary, creates a conflict that manifests itself in cinema in a kind of hybrid form. In A Suitable Bo Boy, Nostalgia's punctuated even more temporal gaps wherein the contemporary viewing of the miniseries that recalls a time past results in an oftentimes halting and awkward recalling and retelling even in the very manner of articulation itself. I can only wonder how a suitable boy might have soared if its cast were allowed to converse in Hindi, Hindustani and Urdu instead of merely peppering snippets of these languages into a pre predominantly English dialogue. For a TV series that at its core alludes to long-lasting... Sorry, do I have just five minutes left? Oh, goodness. Okay, okay, I will hurry up as much as I can. Um, alludes to the long-lasting consequence. Oh, out of 10. Oh, thank God, I thought out of 15. Okay. Um, for a TV series that at its core alludes to the long-lasting consequences of colonial hegemony, um, it sure does prioritize and concretize Western, especially Anglophilic tastes. The series is recalling of the past and, or rather in the present, utterly destabilizes the linearity of the space-time continuum, creating instead a kind of retro time, which forges an uncanny relationship between the viewer and the subject. The interplay between past and present takes place in a manner of enunciation which is so visceral that yesterday is not only rendered vitally proximate, but it almost seems to entrench the inevitability of today in the viewing of the experience of yesterday, defamiliarizing reality to the extent that it unsettles meaning entirely. The contemporary viewing experience is challenged by, and indeed suffused with, the narration of the past, adding to the dematerialization of the site of the cinematic experience, as it, further displaced, as it is further displaced within the abstracted space of imaginary worlds through a retrospectivity of the viewing experience in which the present is not merely haunted by the past, but it is shot through with heterogeneous fragments whose recognition can only render the world unhomely and out of joint. So I thought to write a conclusion as conclusions are meant to be, neatly restating my ideas and thoughts in a cohesive manner, but I thought instead to leave it open-ended to reflect not just the ongoing continuity of a project in motion, but to leave you time to reflect, dialogue, and engage with the topic at hand. Many thanks to you. Okay. <laughs> yes, so I think we have time for questions. Yeah, yeah, hoping to have questions. Questions? Should I use the mic? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind of you to say so. Um, I think it was more than me not liking it. It was I couldn't engage with it because it seemed very halting. It seemed awkward. It seemed pretend. Because on the one hand, you're dealing with a subject matter about the effects of colonialism. And at the same time, you're sort of engaging in the language of the colonizer, but in a halting way. Like my first language is English. I think that's why I was just getting so passionate and like mixing up words in the middle because I wanted to say identity, but then I was like, no, I'm not just an identity. You know, there's so much that goes beyond it. So when I watch A Suitable Boy, I'm watching it as an Indian, as a post-colonial subject. So my eyes are already that much more critical in a way. And I think going back to your second question about the present, I think when, what makes it so out of time is that we're watching something that references a past that we don't know, but using a language of the present, but viewed, 
it's, it's, yeah, it's not easy to unpack. It's not easy to unpack because there's so many temporal layerings to the whole project. You know what I mean? Because I was thinking a lot about Arjun Apadurai and his whole theory on, you know, spaces and, and how that works even in time. So it almost seemed unheimlich in some way, viewing it and watching this very awkward representation and me questioning, is it intentionally awkward? You recalling the past in your present at that time, as I, in my presence, as who I am, am being critical of it. Do you know what I mean? So their present and my present referencing another presence. <laughs> no, it's sort of one of those questions that, that's why I said it's sort of a project in motion because they're, they're things that I don't want to have the arrogance to say I can answer, but certainly put forth ideas about, you know. So yeah, as long as it makes one tilt one's head and, and think, that's a good thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, it doesn't bother me at all. Not at all. Not at all. Yes. It is. It's very much there. It's there in all. Um, it, it underlines the diaspora, I think. This longing for home. What is home? I mean, just by virtue of being the diaspora, we ask ourselves this question all the time. Does our adopt, do we have a right to call our adopted home home? Is our country of origin home? And then watching the subjects that are addressed in, in A Suitable Boy have this longing even for the colonial home that they say they don't want, but yet they do, you know? So there you go. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> in reference to what? In, 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 in The to, Suitable Boy? Yeah, yeah, in reference to the idea of nostalgia. General. Okay, so no, okay, because I need okay to be able to answer you in a way that yeah. is satisfactory. I wanted to just understand if, if it was to do with the television series or in general. Um, you know, because let me just add this because I think there is a limit to the way nostalgia is, is, is dominantly explored. Yeah, um, uh, people need to remember, I think, that. The ones who leave, let's take a massive country like my home country, Nigeria. Mm. Uh, currently, I'm not very sure how many people there are there, at least over 100 million. Let's take India, over a billion. People are still there. The ones who leave are the ones who are not satisfied with being there. Uh, and they are likely not to be satisfied anywhere they go anyways. Uh, I think that's, in my opinion, Thank you for your question, but I would sort of disagree with that because I think it's hard to generalize the people that leave as always choosing to leave because they hope some of them didn't even have a choice, yeah. you know? So for them to have to say that, oh, you know, anywhere they go, they won't be ever satisfied, I think is, is quite a strong generalization. But I do sort of suggest that this idea is of nostalgia is tinged with a longing, sort of like a saudage. It's an idea, you know what I mean? An idea of home. So home becomes a very malleable, sort of elusive, I think is the word I'm grappling around for, concept. And it becomes just that, this concept, um, which is oftentimes even contradictory, you know? I want the colonial, but I shouldn't want it, but I do want, you know, it's, it doesn't have to be airtight black and white compartments, you know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> I didn't intend it as a blanket way mm. uh, because I do think there are kind of some stereotypical metonyms and metaphors used in regard to the to the migrants, the living figure. Um, like in our strong Nigerian communities, our diasporic, especially online communities. Mm. I mean, you see people who leave Nigeria, they go to South Africa, they go to Italy, they go to the UK, they go to Australia. And there, there, I think there are, there's that category of the migrants who will keep moving. 
Maybe. Yeah, yeah, and I maybe think, yeah. so, desperately so, looking for home. Yeah, in some, some reason, that's my point. That yeah. it's a concept. You're looking for something. Like someone asked me the other day, you know, where is because I said I'm going home to India and then home to Naples, and she was like, where is your home? And it made me think. And I said, sometimes I feel like I'm a turtle. My home is like my little shell. I am my home. I was like, you're sono casa. Like I am my home. So I think these migrants that you reference, particularly. Maybe you're right. Maybe they'll never find home because it's a concept that is always there to elude them and give them the hope to continue towards that concept potentially. You know, it's very easy for us to sit here and intellectualize this beautiful room in Sword Orsola. God knows what their actual reality is, you know, but uh, it's just a suggestion and an idea. Okay, thank you. I think we've so much, yeah. run out of time. So thank you again for your wonderful contributions. Good evening. With great pleasure, I present the last speech at this conference. Professor Flavia Cavaliere will talk about preconceived ideas and cliché about Italian identity in a speech entitled The uh, Banking Italian Identity Misconceptions in English Media. Just two words of introduction uh, not to take away the precious time from the colleagues' intervention. Flavia Cavalieri is Associate Professor of English Language and Linguistics at the University of Naples, Federico II, and Fulbright Distinguished Chair at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research interests uh, lie within the field of translation studies, explored in many publications, among which I will only mention uh, the shaping uh, of the news 2012 translation and migration narrative of a transition 2017 thought for food 2019 and so on um, her current research and essays focus on new approaches and insights in interpreting texts on intercultural and intracultural competence and on the relation between language and culture. And uh, um, now, um, I, um, at this point, I just have to give the floor to Professor Cavaliere. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Now let me shortly uh, thank Emila for her invitation and you all for your patience for still being here. I'm, I'm, I apologize, I'm gonna skip lots of slides, so I just want you to get a very, I mean, general idea of my point and then if you're maybe interested in my point, we can get in touch later on, okay? So as you can tell from the title of my presentation, my point is just trying to focus on some of the many misconceptions, or rather I would say misrepresentation of Italian identity in basically in English media, telling misrepresentation because obviously my focus is on multimodal representation. So I'm gonna give you some different ideas on different media ranging from films, adver advertis advertisements and so on. So. Um, needless to say, I'm not uh, just introducing multimodal analysis and also the, um, the influential impact of mass media. But again, Apadura, uh, again, he spoke about the influence of mediascapes, so, which um, created and influenced the way people perceive reality and create, and, uh, I'd say not me, but rather do create and on reinforce public images and ethnic, um, of ethnic groups, in this case of Italian people of Italian heritage. Um, so 
obviously my point is based on many different uh, social cultural um, and social linguistic theories which range from the agenda setting theory cultivation theory May maybe these are the most important ones but they in their very basic form they maintain that media are responsible for cultivating viewers conception of social reality and this is i mean this happens more frequently and in a larger amount than we can think uh, so all these media they really subtly shape their perception our perception of realities uh, because it's, it happens in a hidden way. So this is very dangerous somehow. Uh, and obviously, needless to say, the more hours people spend living in the world of television or, or media, whatever they are, I mean, they are more likely to see the real world in terms of, the, um, of these images, these port portrayals or values they, they just um, perceive through the lens of these media. So, um, as for the Italian identity, we know that through history, basically on-screen portrayals of Italian Americans in this case have generally been uh, portrayed as negative, negatively as mobster, uh, peasant gobbling down spaghetti, and these all cause very harmful stereotypes which are still uh, associated with this ethnic group more than we can think. Um, so. As I said, these standardized and generalized mental pictures believe, um, namely create, are, have permitted basically through the media. Um, let's consider, for example, some films. Uh, let's consider Saturday Night Fever, uh, My Cousin Winnie, which is, I mean, a very recent one, and Jungle Fever. Uh, they each depicted Italian American characters as crazy, crazy in the sense that they were unable to struggle to assimilate into American culture, for example. Uh, in other cases, it is the um, Italian characters are of characters of Italian heritage are generally depicted as uneducated and tricked people that lie in order to succeed. Uh, but obviously, the most recurrent uh, stereotypical representation is the, the gangster, the, the mafioso. Um, and this uh, obviously has been the, the most prominent impact. So we have never ending streams of films, uh, uh, written text, and multimodal representation of these Italian Americans belonging to the mafia and the world. Um, I'm, okay, I'm skipping how it did all start in terms of history, uh, but again, all the, this was also totally, uh, I mean, fake news, we could say at that time, but in terms of uh, media representation, let's consider that the very first equation on the screen generally dates back to the silent picture. So I'm thinking about the, um, the beginning of that century and films like The Bland Hand, Italian Blood, The Last of Mafia. So before, um, at, at the very beginning of the cinema um, market, we, ha we already have this kind of a stereotypical representation. The, anyway, the movie that really started the phenomenon of the Italian mafioso was Little Caesar, which has generally been considered as the grandfather of modern crime. And since then, I mean, audiences began to all over the world began to be conditioned to associate organized crime exclusively with Italian Americans. Okay, this is from Little Caesar, and this is a, um, a, a scene from the the, the, the film, which um, I will uh, go back later on. Other, I mean, as I said, we have an endless list of, of um, films. Uh, just let me name Scarface, Al Capone, The Scarface Mob, Alcatraz Express, The Untouchable, Mean Street, Godfellas, Casino, Road to Perdition. Uh, but obviously, needless, needless to say, it was uh, Francis Coppola's uh, adaptation of Mario Puzo bestseller, The Godfather, which gave in 1972 the American mobster a worldwide cinematic Booth, I would say that uh, he was glamorized, was glorified, and somehow it's still, it is still uh, on this kind of uh, representation. So uh, they set uh, new benchmarks for the, Italian, the American cinema, and so the Italian mobster, as I said, was glorified. Uh, in, to the point that even mafioso, real mafioso, inspired their lives to what they just saw in films. So we know that, I, I can't remember the name, but we had one of the very famous uh, Camorrisa who had his villas uh, built 
on the one he had seen in the film, in the mafioso film. So we have a sort of, uh, I mean, never ending, a chain reaction, a loop, okay? So uh, who started first, somehow we could say. So um, the Godfather and the Italian heritage, I mean, is uh, portrayed since the very opening scenes. And here we have a lot of elements which we will find in many, many other representations. So family loyalty, blood ties, the need to earn respect, the, and the far-reaching corrupting influence of power, the home, whatever it means, as we have said, uh, listened so far, music, food, and kitchen cooking. In particular, we have this kind of food fixation, which is uh, uh, recurrent in many, many other films. Let's consider, for example, in a movie like Rocky, the boxing opponent mentioned that if he can't find, I bet he can cook because he's Ital of Italian heritage. Or in the royal treatment, for example, he said, you don't have to feed them all the time, and sure, I do, I'm Italian. So again, this kind of stereotypical representation can be found in all kinds of films where we have um, Ital characters of Italian heritage. Also in Goodfellas, for example, when the man went to visit the other friend's mother, um, it, she constantly asked if she can feed them, making the formula of pasta. Then we also have, and this is, I mean, I would, in my own opinion, even more dangerous, the fact that we generally we have, as I said, family is one of the pillars of this kind of representation. But, and as I said, this is very, very dangerous, in many cases associated with bloodshed. So remember I, I told you before that the scene I showed you before in The Little Caesar, we have the two eating spaghetti after, immediately after um, a man, I mean, a man's loader, a very bloody man's loader. So again, this somehow in a very hidden and subtle way suggests the fact that we Italians, I mean, consider the same at the same level. So we can uh, eat spaghetti and just murder people. It's exactly the same. So um, apart from uh, characters, this kind of gangster, we have pe people we generally are representing like being hot tempered and also again with this kind of food fixation. Um, this is another example, um, no more a mafioso one, but a slightly different. But again, we have also, again a negative representation. I'm sure all of you are not familiar, but at least have heard about the. the um, the series Friends, and uh, uh, why all the other friends, uh, I mean, have decent job and are uh, have their own life. The only one, Joe Tribbiani, who's of Italian heritage, basically he's unemployed, he's lazy, he's a food loving, he's a playboy, uh, he's got strongly tied with his family, and last but not least, he's dim witted. Is the is the 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 last want to just understand the situation, what's going on, on just to, for example, understand a pun, a joke, or whatever. This is his typical expression, which just expresses his difficulty in understanding what's going on. So again, we have another kind of stereotype typical representation. Uh, other kinds of representation, again, of uh, people who have a very, so to say, low position in the social ladder or generally are unemployed and whatever or come from very uneducated situation and scenarios can be found in these films. But as you can see, you could say I started from the scratch because obviously the Godfather is not a little Caesar. Obviously, they are not particularly recent ones. But as you have a look at the very last one, which is the royal treatment, uh, it dates back last here. So I would say that the, the stereotypical representation hasn't changed a lot. So again, for Rocky, other films like Saturday Night Fever, if they're not mafioso, as I said, basically they come from very, um, so to say, difficult and uncomfortable uh, scenario, for example. And when, as a foreign Winnie, the, the, the character is a lawyer, he's anyway, he's portrayed as a joke. So again, uh, nobody to be taken seriously. Um, so, um, as for, this is for the men, what about women? I mean, we have only two options, okay? So we can have only the serious bombshell or the overbearing Italian mama. Um, so this is, uh, in, so in all kinds of films, they have the same, not really the same um, representation, like having big wear, lot of makeup, or on the other side, we have the elderly overweight uh, housewife and grandmother. So basically, these are the two representations, no other options. So again, very, very stereotypical uh, representation. 
uh, the Godfather, as I said, can influence continues to um, reverberate, and it could also be found in uh, many other TV series, for example. So, so um, the point is, anyway, that all these kind of characters, apart from, for example, Little Caesar, uh, who uh, was based on Al Alfonso Al, Al Capone, who was really um, lived. I mean, he was a real uh, person, real people. Uh, on the other hand, both most um, no, gangster films and so on, and this is this, um, just quoting some data, uh, they were based on fictional maps, so like for example Vito Corleone in The Godfather, but I'm going to show you in a while some survey where when students not still nowadays, uh, not of Italian origin, in American university were asked to name the very first Ita Italian uh, character, whatever, not character, but person who came to their mind, they answered Vito Corleone. So again, this is a clear example of how they have been influenced by, uh, okay, so this is just to show you how the mob portrayals, only 12% were based in these films on real um, characters of American heritage. Anyhow, this is generally how people, Italian people of Italian heritage are represented in films, and as you can see, not particularly um, positive representations. Um, so the point is that uh, this, this study I'm mentioning here has been studied, has been conducted by the American, the Association of Italian um, People in America, and they um, showed how, for years, Americans' view of the ethnic group have been impacted by what they seen on TV, but on TV we could say also media in general. Um, and again, okay. Um, um, I have to skip, I'm afraid, but I, I think that we cannot but agree with Maria Laurino. She's an American, an American writer of Italian heritage, and she speaks of a dignitary harm, which they, as generation, uh, second and third generation of Italian American, are still living. Also, because I mentioned films, but uh, we should also have to consider the television series. Let's think of The Soprano, Boardwalk Empire, Jersey Shore. All of these, and in some cases, some of them, if not, I'm not wrong, Jersey Shore, also they've been suited by Italian Americans owing to their negative uh, representation of people of Italian ethnicity. Um, again, I think you are all familiar with this TV series. I have no time to um, talk about and describe the, the guidos and the that, that they again spread negative stereotypes about Italians. Uh, as I said, I just wanted to give, to give you, um, because uh, time is running out, just a few ideas. But unfortunately, not, we can find that these negative portrayals not only in films um, or TV series, but uh, surprise, surprise, in cartoon as well. Let's consider, which is again is even more dangerous because they speak directly to younger generation. Let's consider cartoons like Shark Tales, for example, where the mafioso uh, sharks are obviously Don Lino uh, and Don, as we all know, marks the highest rank in the hierarchical structure of gangster clan. And again, here you can see how mm. also in this representation, the influence from the Godfather, which, as I said, can be considered as, the, as the, the origin, maybe, or one of the most influential origin of all this kind of stereotypical, he is somehow re in this kind of uh, uh, cartoon, um, which was also very, very pervasive, uh, particularly in America. Um, okay, Spielberg. Uh, um, it was a cartoon by Spielberg who in turn um, just considered how he himself had been uh, suffered from uh, racial discrimination, but this is another story. Also in terms of cartoons, we have also The Good Feathers, and again here we have also Pan with The Good Father, and again we have some pigeons who again are, guess what, from of Italian origin. Um, also, as for the electronic entertainment, we have a lot of video games where uh, mafia based on mafia and uh, the Italianization of names and characters is a very constant feature. Uh, for example, all the names generally end with uh, a vowel in order to suggest that they are from Italian origin, but they are very popular video games where, just to give you an example, P players take on the role of Tommy Angelo and hit score by smashing the rival's head with the baseball bat. And this happens only for Italians, okay? 
So uh, no surprise that the president of Unico National Organization, which is an organization which aims to promote and enhance the image of Italian Americans, they just uh, said that these kind of um, video games are a lot of racist nonsense, derogatory and insulting for Italian Americans, but they would say Italians everywhere. So this is uh, from the... the um, so again, the Italian mobs in all these video games controls only the, Itali the Italians controls this kind of illegal uh, activities, and also the entertainment industries. Also, they uh, just sold, for example, again to associate Italy, whose heritage in terms of music is very important. But again, also in this case, has been associated with the mafia. So we have a mob hits Christmas edition of Italian music. So. Um, Christmas is approaching, so we have some. Um, what uh, advertising is again another huge world where lots of uh, misrepresentation of Italianicity. I mean, maybe possibly is at its best. And again, in particular, the most sold, so to say, image is again the mafioso one. Um, Okay, this is about, this is about uh, multimodality, but this is basically, as you can see in this image, I would say this uh, summarizes all the, the typical representation and modes through which uh, Italians generally are uh, represented. Okay, so we have generally the leather jackets. Another example I just did not mention was uh, Arthur Fonzarelli, for example, or the, the fedora hat, the casual clothes, the white vest, again, taken from this is taken from the godfather and he started uh, a very um, frequent representation of italianicity um, and derives as i said from uh, sonny corleone in the godfather so again here i tried to summarize in a table uh, you can have a look at the most recurrent modes in terms of uh, just postures recurrent themes ima imagery sound and so on but as you can see all of them are not particularly uh, positive team. Um, so advertiser, particularly advertisers, have reenacted and mimicked, I would say, um, the Italianicity, and so again, national stereotypes have been and still are refashioned and re in a very negative way. So, um, also again, as you can see here, we have. I'm I'm very sorry, I can't. I have, we have no time to just see um, the, the videos of these uh, um, advertisement. But if you're interested, I can send you the send you the, the link because again, here we have a clear process of re but again here in terms of um, parody and they mimic what the, the, the main uh, element, the role model was. Obviously in this case they sell um, orange juices but the whole scene is based on represented and the, the, as you can see the logo, uh, the music itself but there are all the stereotypes I mentioned. This is the, I think we have no time. No. Okay, so <laughs> I have many, many uh, different examples. Again, here we have a car for the whole family. Guess what type of family they are referring to? It's the family, the familia, no, mafiosa. And they put corpses into a very huge uh, trunk. So basically, the, the main idea is that everybody is very large, and uh, um, so they suggest to buy this car. Here again, the hard is chicken parmesan. So all different types also of products reenact and re these kind of stereotypes, but in this case, just exploiting irony and parody. But again, the message is again this, and the final idea is this kind of dignitary harm. So no wonder as I is if we have this kind of a survey where, for example, uh, and these are quite... Um, Updated a survey, 44% uh, of teenagers still associate Italian Americans with criminal activities, while the other 34% as blue colors. I mean, what about Fiorello La Guardia, just to mention one of them, but they never, they're never mentioned. So here, a cultivation effect is definitely uh, working, okay? Um, also, again, as I told you, anticipated before, this is another survey uh, conducted at the Film Studies Department and Purdue University. 
and um, these are the main uh, interesting questions for example name the first famous Italian off the top of your head while um, students from Italian heritage mentioned Mussolini anyway but he was uh, Italian like it or not but the others just mentioned um, people who acted so actors who somehow acted in uh, mafioso film while and also and this is quite obviously a con direct consequence name at least three things that come to your mind when thinking of italian americans while students from italian americans obviously used uh, positive adject adjectives the other ones the very first immediate term which came to their mind was mafia soprano greedy sneaky good food violence gun accent hairy breeze dag dago and mean um Okay, other, other um, survey which somehow confirmed this very negative uh, um, perception, reception, I would say first, and then perception of Italianicity. Um, official data also um, given by um, the U.S. Department of Justice, which clearly demonstrated that all this association is totally, I mean, false, I would say. Um, Again, so as I said before, um, contrary to what uh, students think, white collar job in uh, in the U.S. Um, represented the 66 percent of the work for workforce. Like, and they just are physician, attorney, corporation, teachers, and so on. I mean, all kind of jobs are positive, but the point is that they immediately Italians are associated with something which is supposedly. Um, thought as something which is not particularly relevant in the, in society so uh, what can we say that um, these all these kind of cliched portrayals as uh, the survey demonstrate uh, so these kind of imagined communities just to quote anderson i would say are the direct result of what people just see and come touch on, through medias whatever they are i mean we can also very, very, uh, I'm going to give you a very, uh, again, uh, just hint about eat, pray, and love, just as we want to speak about literature, if we can just consider, but let's say books, not literature, uh, and film, eat, pray, and love. And again, for example, here, just have a look how important and how spread was the film and the book first and then the film. Um, for example, when um, the character comes to Naples, to visit Naples, um, here, just have a look at in bold okay the, the most frequent words and so semantic areas naples is associated with basically we are described we napolitans are described as animals crazy loudness um uneducated bossy annoyed loud voice and this is for all the the representation and just to make you laugh, Naples is also depicted in a very rainy day. So also the, the only positive stereotype that we had, uh, uh, Sole Pizza and Mandolino, is also debunked because she comes and visits Naples when she was raining. So, uh, and this is quite, uh, in, and I'm going to just conclude, that the... the, um, the um, the character, I mean, comes to Naples because she has a very important mission to accomplish, which is to eat the best pizza. And uh, uh, she is taking lesson, Italian lesson in Rome, and this guy is from Naples, and she say, and I'm quoting from the book, I can imagine shy, studious, sympathetic Giovanni as a young boy among these, and I don't use the word lightly mob. I mean, in other terms, she's surprised that he can also speak English, even though he's from Naples, okay? Um, these are other examples from uh, tough screaming, the crooked old boys, and so on. This is also a scene where she described 80 year old boys just having guns. Unfortunately, in some cases, this is true, but uh, recent uh, recent episodes uh, Jim confirmed that but again this is quite really dangerous because we are depicted particularly abroad in a very very um, negative ways so uh, the point is that we should all consider the fact that identity first of all and in particular ethnic identity is not fun is not something which can be clearly cut depicted and uh, described but we, could, we should consider that identities are the way is something that 
somehow, first of all, changes with us during life, and it's the name that we give to the different ways we are positioned by and position ourselves within the narrative of the past, and our cultural identity, wherever we come from, belongs to the future as much to the past, so we cannot just be frozen in this kind of identity, not to say so negative, uh, negative representation as we have seen so far. I apologize for my speed, but I'm, I was afraid to be, I mean, as I was, to uh, talk to Tiv. Many thanks for your attention. I thank very, very much Professor Caliere for this speech she was uh, perfect in time i fear uh, but i fear that there is um, no time for questions Sorry. either one question <laughs> um, questions about the topics that uh, professor cavaliere have raised um, but you you think no we have no time i'm afraid <laughs> Really sorry. Uh, uh, no problem at all. Just one reflection. I thought that uh, uh, this um, Anglo-American representation as the ancient Florentine uh, translations from medieval age uh, seems uh, seem. Um, being like uh, a um, um, rhetoric representation uh, used by other um, different linguistic tradition. I think at the K uh, Korean K drama about the, the, the character of the mafioso. In a K drama uh, titled Vincenzo, the main character is a mafioso, but a happy mafioso. Uh, so, I mean, all the negative stereotypes of the Anglo American tradition, not media tradition, uh, become positive. Uh, stereotypes uh, and uh, representation. I'm afraid I can't think, I, can, I don't understand what, I mean, even if he's a happy mafioso, I mean, mafioso is still, if I asked, if you associated me with mafioso, I wouldn't be ha happy of this kind of immediate association, even though I'm just represented as a happy pe person in my life. All right, let them no, uh, uh, I think uh, there is even a... in other kinds of my point was that I mean, first of all, I would say that this this happens from Italianicity because I was considering Italianicity, but we can say possibly also other ethnical identities are misrepresented. What I'm mm -hmm. trying to I'm inviting all of us of reading between the lines and not I mean just taking everything which we are shown and represented, but because the danger is that the more we are re just presented this kind of uh, narratives, we get accustomed to them, so we, we are not critical, and we immediately associate uh, people with this kind of representation, okay, for imagined communities, okay, from, but all kind of generalization are always very, very dangerous, so we should always aware of these. This is my point. Thank you. So Antonio and I are really grateful for your time, um, for the energy and passion you put into this. So thank you, thank you, and until next time. <laughs>